uh, January the 12th, 2021, Lynchburg City uh, School Board meeting to order. And I would like to say Happy New Year to everyone. In light of all that is going on, I feel that it would be appropriate that our first order would be to stand and acknowledge the Pledge of Allegiance at this time. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, in, uh, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, members of the Lynchburg City School Board and all uh, in attendance. Uh, tonight, I would like to acknowledge that the Lynchburg City School Board has a uh, relatively full agenda for our meeting. And at the onset, I would like to remind all of us who are in attendance uh, and or viewing in the lobby to act with dignity and respect for all present. I do want to acknowledge that our protocols over uh, time since the governor's order in March and going forward, we have worked under uh, health and safety protocols for our administration building. And we again want to remind everyone we welcome you and ask that you would wear a face mask at all times, maintain a six feet social distancing, abide by limited seating requirements as defined by the maximum occupancy standards due to COVID-19, sit in the designated uh, public viewing area, do not remove or rearrange seating, refrain from any disruptive activities such as talking outbursts, making distracting noises while the meeting is in session. If in dressing the school board, please wait to be called into the boardroom, continue to wear your mask and maintain six feet social distancing while addressing the board. And after addressing the school board, please return to the public viewing area in the lobby. Please vacate the premises uh, once the meeting is adjourned. We do want to thank our board for uh, working together as we have uh, been carrying these uh, matters going forward. Those who engage in disruptive behavior tonight will be warned first by the chair and then asked to leave. Thank you so much for your compliance. Uh, as you have your agenda before you on tonight, uh, item B is dealing with the realities of electronic participation in the meeting. And if you will allow me, this is a action item that we do need to take care of tonight board. And as it relates to that, I do want to acknowledge that the school board uh, may conduct any meeting except closed meetings as outlined in policy um, BDD. And that policy allows uh, on or before the day of a meeting a member of the school board to notify the chair that such member is unable to attend the meeting due to a temporary or permanent disability or other medical condition that prevents the member's physical attendance or that such member is unable to attend the meeting due to a personal matter related but not limited to extenuating circumstances associated with employment, military or family emergency and identifies with specificity the nature of the personal matter and the school board approves the member's participation by a majority vote of the members present at the primary or central meeting location. Participation by a school board member may be electronic communication means it can be due to a personal matter is li listed and limited to uh, two meetings within each calendar year. And so with the provisos that we have to conduct school board business with the appropriate quorum uh, present, what is the pleasure of the board to honor the request of school board member uh, Kim Sinha to meet with us tonight electronically uh, that would not include the closed meeting at the end of our uh, deliberations tonight. Uh, is there a motion uh, to uh, accept uh, her request? I move. Uh, it's been moved by Dr. Sinha, seconded by Dr. Carter. Yes, Are there Dr. any? Gupta. Dr. Gupta, excuse me, moved by Dr. Gupta, seconded by Dr. Carter. Is there any discussion or unreadiness? Uh, yes. I, I would just 
ask that whatever we need to do to fix the policy reference to BDD that, that we Yes, sir. We it's it is BDD. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so BDD okay. and then BDC. Thank you, Dr. Nillis. Any other questions or discussion concerning the motion made by Dr. Gupta, seconded by Dr. Carter? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion carries. And uh, we will now uh, be able to Zoom Dr. Sinha into our meeting. And uh, thank you, Dr. Sinha, for your uh, participation. And uh, Dr. Sinha, when you want to uh, address the board, I'm sure Dr. Edwards or someone will help me to appreciate that you are doing that since I can't see you as such. All right. Thank you so very much. Uh, that thank, you. thank you, Dr. Sinha. We now move to item C, which is the agenda approval. And as you can see the agenda before you that has been featured and uh, you see all of the items that are listed, including our closed meeting at the end. Is there a motion to approve the agenda for tonight's school board meeting? So moved to approve the agenda. Been moved by Dr. Nillis, seconded by Dr. Brennan. Any questions or discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor indicate, indicate by, by saying. All right. All right. All right. All right. Okay. Have some added features to it. Right. Okay. All right. All right. Seems like we've got that uh, organized. Thank you to our awesome technical technical staff. Thank you for that. All right. The agenda has been approved, and now we will move to item D one which is pertaining to uh, public uh, comments. I do uh, want to share uh, with the board relative to our public comments that as COVID-19 cases increase, the school board will continue to ensure the safety of LCS staff, board members, and the community. For this reason, the school board will temporarily suspend in-person in public, public in-person public comments during school board meetings for the period of January the 1st through the 31st, 2021. And so let the board uh, be aware of that in our work session on next week. Uh, we would need to have some conversation around that. Uh, with that in mind for our public comments tonight, uh, we do want to acknowledge uh, before you these uh, appropriate uh, statements. School board meetings are streamed live on YouTube and televised on Comcast Channel 17 at 5 p.m. Meetings are rebroadcast daily on Comcast at 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. and available online on the LCS YouTube channel. The meetings are also broadcast on the television located in the public meeting seating area, which is located in the lobby of the administration building on the night of the meeting. In accordance with policy BDDH, public participation, the school board welcomes requests and comments as established in the guidelines within that policy and as modified in response to COVID-19 health and safety protocols. Persons or groups wishing to address the school board may do so by choosing one of the following. One, send a written statement to the school board clerk uh, at the uh, said uh, email address, uh, daytp at lcsedu.net. Statements will be read during the public comment section of the school board meeting. Two, leave a voice message on the school board clerk's phone line at 434-515-5077. Messages will be played during the public comment section of the school board meeting. And third, hand deliver your written statement to the school board clerk 15 minutes prior to the school board meeting. Statements will be read during the public comment section of the school board meeting. Written statements and or voice messages should include the name of the person su uh, submitting the comment, the subject of his or her remarks, and be limited to three minutes per individual and five minutes per group. 
All email written statements and or voice messages must be received no later than two hours prior to the start of the meeting. All handwritten statements must be received no later than 15 minutes prior to the start of the meeting. And so those are our public comments uh, dynamics. With no in-person comments, we believe we have one audio voice message and we would like to start with that uh, uh, school board clerk. Good evening, Lynchburg City School Board. My name is Andrew Glover. I'm an LCS parent and represent the conservative parents of Lynchburg, a group of over 200 Lynchburg families, teachers, and LCS staff members. Tonight, we would like to continue to share our concerns and entreat you to reopen Lynchburg City School build buildings and allow a return to face-to-face -face learning on a full-time schedule for those families that choose to send their kids back to school. On December 14th, the conservative parents of Lynchburg placed a FOIA request for a summary document of LCS grades to date for the school year compared to last year. In response, we were provided grades for quarter one of both the 2019-2020 school year and the 2020-2021 school year. The difference is eye-opening and unnerving. At EC Glass, failure rates in Algebra 1 increased 288%. World literature failure rates increased 315%, American literature 364%, and world history 700%. For those same classes at Heritage High School, the increase in failure rates was 440% for Algebra 1, 192% for world literature, 300% for American lit, and 273% in world history. The story is not unique to high school either. For instance, at Sandusky Middle School, English literature across all three grades had an average increase of 189% in Fs. Social studies at the middle school saw an average increase of 381%, and math saw an average of over 1,000% increase in failures, with one class going from four failures in quarter one of 2019 to 59 failing grades in quarter one of 2020. These are just the failing grades. What the data doesn't tell us is how many kids have dropped a grade, such as those who used to be A students but are now struggling to maintain a B or a C grade. In order to perform that type of analysis would require access to personally identifiable information and as such is something that only the Lynchburg City Schools can perform. Grades are only a single, grades are only a single indicator of success and many variables contribute to their outcome. However, right now, these grades are acting as a smoke signal, alerting us that the problems and concerns parents have been bringing before you are in fact real and will have a real impact on the kids' lives and the community as a whole. It is time that we pay attention to these warning signals and use them as an indicator that there are problems in the school that cannot remain unaddressed. As much as been, has been done and as hard as our teachers are working, there are problems with the curriculum. There are problems with the online platforms, such as Google Classroom and Seesaw, and there's problems with the virtual instruction. It's time to realize that students cannot adequately or exclusively be educated via YouTube and Zoom video, and that classrooms need to be reopened on a full-time basis for those parents that want to send their kids back to face-to-face -face instruction. Parents should have a choice on whether to send their kids back to school for face-to-face -face learning. No one is seeking to force families to send their kids back to school buildings before they're ready. Our request is simply to ensure that publicly funded schools are open for students whose families are ready for that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Glover, for your uh, voice message for us. We appreciate it. Uh, at this time, we've received several uh, written uh, public comments and the vice chair and I will uh, take turns reading uh, those comments that have come to us as described in my earlier reading to the board clerk. I know many board members receive personal correspondences or to the group, but only those that have come to the clerk are we reading tonight. I will begin uh, by sharing something that I believe also uh, is being shared maybe in another venue as well, but Anna Smith. Dear members of the uh, LCS uh, school board, my name is Anna Smith and I am writing to you my public comment by contributing my opposition for a return to learn 
and support pandemic compensation for LCS workers. Before I proceed, I must first address a petition I created and shared that gained a great deal of attention within the Lynchburg community, which originally planned a peaceful protest by stopping buses from running before picking students up, later attending the LCS school board meeting on January the 12th, 2021, intentionally set after school started rather than before giving no opportunity for possible changes to decisions made by LCS regarding return to learn. Due to LCS making the decision to return to learn with no public input on December the 15th, 2020, I was contacted anonymously with concerns and idea to stop buses. However, after much consideration, I felt uh, it would not be effective changing the petition, taking out the action to stop buses, and even though not illegal, but rather a form of civil disobedience. I later revised the petition in entirely counseling both events for a COVID safe, more direct way of taking action by reading, signing, and sharing the petition, submitting a public comment to be presented at the meeting, and taking further steps by submitting input to the Lynchburg City Council, Virginia Board of Education, and Virginia Governor's Office. Unfortunately, someone at LCS took the petition out of context, sending an email alerting parents, spreading false misinformation, insinuating possible threat to safety by acts of violence to not only LCS staff, but students who were never mentioned or involved, which created unnecessary fear, worry, and upset a lot of people. Considering the horrific events that recently took place in Washington, D.C., I understand the concern. However, if the petition was read correctly with original plans to stop buses, it clearly read peaceful protest and taking place before buses leave, never mentioning or provoking any harm or threat to safety by acts of violence, especially to students. I was very disappointed that anyone would assume such a thing and personally do not support or condone any of this ever. Just because a peaceful protest is planned does not assume or insinuate there will be violence or safety concerns. Regardless of the mishap, I reached out on Facebook Messenger, contacted LCS to express my apology for my any misunderstanding, never intended updating on revisions made. The petition received 125 signatures as of 2 p.m. on January the 12th, 2021. And if any members are interested in viewing the petition for themselves, please follow the link provided. Express my concern by opposing return to learn in the classroom. I would hope you realize and acknowledge the rapidly growing number of COVID-19 cases in Lynchburg area. LCS reassuring schools are safe by being clean and precautions taken, adding the assumption the virus is more of a community spread, which is highly inaccurate due to scientific studies providing kids are super spreaders regardless of extra hygiene practice is merely irresponsible and is potentially harmful to the general public if it was to spread outside the school, which can, will, and has already. I would like to share the simple, obvious uh, concept of the more that gather together gives risk or higher risk of exposure and spreading it to someone else who may or may not die. Remember your bus driver who died of COVID or did everyone forget? If this virus was not on such a serious, massive global scale, it would never be considered a pandemic. Everyone from sea to shining sea has been affected by this in some way, sacrificing and adjusting to a new uncertain way of life, wanting to return to work, classrooms with life going back to normal as soon as possible. However, we cannot rush this because if we do, COVID-19 will never slow down or go away, making us have to deal or cope longer. Regretfully, we do not have the luxury to do what is wanted. We must do what is needed. No doubt there is concern of either failing grades or potential onset of mental issues with students staying home, not having oh, social interaction. Time, time is up. I'm so very sorry. Uh, Anna Smith, we do thank you for what you have shared to us, and uh, we will make sure that all board members have that uh, in its entirety. Are we uh, back? Yes, ma'am. Are we back online? Is this now being broadcast? Yes. Should be, okay. yes. All right. 
Thank you. I just want to make sure that the public can hear the comments. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. Uh, very important, uh, uh, Susan. All right, Dr. Brennan. So my uh, comment is from Carl Luce, president of Lynchburg Education Foundation. Hello to all, and I hope this new year finds you safe and healthy. I am Carl Luce, and I have the privilege of serving as president of the Lynchburg Education Association. Since I have contacted all of you individually, and I thank Dr. Coleman for his response, I will keep my comments brief. There are three key issues that are of great concern to our members. The first would be the metrics used by LCS to deter determine in-person versus remote instruction. After the release of the video explaining the types of things LCS would use to determine whether or not we would have students in the building, we have only seen the numbers go up. LCS has 20, had 20 cases last week and students weren't even in the building. Lynchburg General had to go code red because of the strain that has been placed on them. Yet, we are told that LCS looks at the metrics and determined it was safe for students and staff to return to in-person instruction. We would like to see an explanation of the data used to make this decision and comparison to the data when LCS chose remote instruction prior to the break. Second, FFCRA ran out as of December 31st, 2020. However, there is an extension available through March 31st, 2021 to school divisions with a tax incentive attached. Amherst County has already taken advantage of this for its workers. Surely, if LCS can determine that its students can be back in the buildings at this time, then it can also protect staff members from having to use their own sick days as a result of COVID exposure and testing protocols. Third, LCS needs to take up the issue of employee pay. We are asking staff to work during a pandemic, asking drivers to cover multiple runs, asking food service employees to provide nutrition in multiple ways, and asking staff to educate people in person and remotely simultaneously. At the very least, we can unfreeze their pay schedules. Right now, many employees have no confidence in LCS. If you check on the division's website under HR, you will find nearly 100 job openings currently. Instead of saying you respect your employees, show them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Britton. Thank you, Mr. Carl Luce for sharing that with us. Our next uh, public comment is from Skylar Dempsey Hansen, and he is uh, articulating his concerns around staff COVID accommodations. Dear LCS School Board, first I wanted to say thank you so much for all of your work in these incredibly difficult times. The LCS School Board and the entire staff of LCS deserves absolute appreciation and respect for the Herculean effort required during this pandemic. I so appreciate the option for our kids to attend in-person hybrid school, even amid the rise in COVID cases. I understand that the pandemic has reached critical levels in our community and that a petition has been distributed outlining concerns for staff. I too am concerned for our community and the staff at LCS. It is my understanding that COVID paid leave relief has expired at this time and that many staff do not have sufficient sick leave available to cover a period of quarantine. I'm worried that staff will ignore safety measures like quarantining or reporting COVID-19 exposure in order to collect a paycheck. Can anything be done to cover their pandemic sick leave with paid time off? I am especially concerned about the bus driver's health considering that bus drivers contact many children from many schools during the course of the day. I was saddened to learn that LCS lost a beloved bus driver to COVID and hope that this will not reoccur. I am concerned that bus drivers do not have adequate safety measures in place to protect themselves and our kids. Is it possible to provide bus drivers with um, N95 mask as ventilation on buses been assessed for safety. Thank you again for your time and attention. Kind regards, Skylar. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hansen. Thank you, uh, Dr. Coleman. The next uh, comment is from Elizabeth Lacey. I am writing you today to share my concerns about the staff and students being in hybrid model for the remainder of the school year. 
With the surge in cases recently, I feel that it is not in the best interest of students and all staff being in the school buildings. I have three kids in Lynchburg City Schools and they have not been doing hybrid model. They will continue to do remote only through the remainder of the school year. Even though my children want to be back in school with their friends and see their teachers, they understand the severity of COVID. We have already had one staff member pass away from COVID. We don't need any more than that. As a parent, I value every staff and student's life. How many more lives is it going to take before the school goes back to remote only. It's very disheartening to think that the health and safety of everyone doesn't seem to be a top priority. I understand that this year has been really difficult on students who have been virtual, but at the same time, they are healthy and will be able to catch up on work. We need our staff and students healthy. There are a lot of people who happen to be caregivers in the school system. It's so important that everyone be safe and healthy. I urge you to please reconsider going back to remote only for the remainder of the school year. Thank you for your time, Elizabeth Lacey. Thank you, Bob. Yes, sir. Our next public comment is from Melissa Chesney, uh, LCS school bus driver number 34, and a representative of several other bodies to include LEA. Good evening. First, I would like to state that the specific transportation related policies Dr. Edwards spoke about at the last public school board were a gross misrepresentation at best. I've spoken at several school board meetings telling you all that the bus drivers have been trying to get their schedules completed correctly for months now with no avail. The dispatchers say the schools won't give them lists of kids actually riding. The schools say they sent the list or that the parents won't call them back. So the drivers are still going to stops and kids are not riding. It's a waste of time, energy, and resources. Then you tell us that, so sorry you are literally dying here, but we are going to double your runs again. It is absolute insanity. We are facing another day where COVID positive cases increase by 100 people with no bed space available at the hospital, 26% positivity rate. The CDC says we shouldn't even think of sending kids to face to face unless we are under 5%. To top matters off, you have us in transportation violating every single contract tracing protocol when you double these runs up. I walked into this morning to a schedule pinned to mine, thrust in my face and was told to do this. It was an entire other buses run. HS middle and two elementary on top of my high school middle and three elementary. I spent the next four hours driving around town trying to frantically put two at times opposite schedules together in my head while still obeying every safety rule out there and driving in morning rush hour traffic. And for the next two weeks, my students and the other driver's students can't be contact traced because no one goes back and looks at the logs to see who covered whose run on any particular day. On top of all the absolute mayhem you all are perpetrating on us, you tell us that you won't cover COVID sick days anymore. Well, I already know you force teachers home sick to work from home, but you and I know for a fact that you have more than enough sick days in the communal pot from all the employees you send into retirement, refusing to pay their earned sick time to cover our sick time when we catch COVID or have to quarantine because of your forced exposure. Thank you so much, Melissa, for your words. Again, we will share those remaining comments with the board. Thank you so much, Melissa. Uh, Dr. Brennan? Yes, sir. So the next comment is from Jen, Jen Staten. Dear school board members, when you signed up for this position, I'm sure you never imagined you'd be navigating a global pandemic and making choices to close schools or risk the lives of staff and students. I thank you for serving and for making the safety of our community your top priority during this time. 
I understand that ideally you want every student in the buildings as often as possible. At this time though, the best way for our students and faculty to be successful and healthy is for the majority of them to be virtual. When we look at the UVA COVID model, we see that we have, that we have not yet reached the projected peak for the virus in our area yet. According to their predictions, that should happen in mid-February. Around the same time, teachers and employees will be eligible to be vaccinated according to the Virginia rollout plan. <clears throat> so there's light at the end of the tunnel. For now though, Lynchburg needs you to make some hard calls. Our hospital has said it is at capacity for treating COVID patients. When our teachers and staff members do get sick, and they will, they will have nowhere local to receive care. At very least, please cancel all sports extracurriculars and consider keeping all regular ed secondary students virtual. Taking these steps with drastically reduced risk by eliminating the mixing of cohorts at sports, extracurricular practices, and the mixing of students and their germs at the secondary level as they change classes. Please, we have already lost one bus driver. I have been listening to bus drivers and teachers and they are scared to be at work. Symptomatic spread may be low among students, but it is not low among our staff. For the secondary age group, virtual works really well when teachers are focusing on virtual only. When we ask them to do both the job of teaching in person and virtually, they become overwhelmed and exhausted and couldn't keep up. Let's allow them to do one job and do it well until they are able to receive a vaccination and Lynchburg is on the downward end of the UVA projections. This plan would allow for K through five and special education students to be in person, which would ease the childcare burden that many families are facing. This year is about teaching our children to be empathetic and adaptable and teaching them the importance of caring for the greater good of our community. Please don't force our teachers and staff members into the buildings. Again, thank you for your service to the board and for allowing me the opportunity to present my thoughts tonight. Jen Staten. Thank you, Jen, and thank you, Bob, for reading that. Our next public comment is from Jonathan Bumgarner, and he wants to address us regarding a response to current current COVID-19 pandemic. Good evening, Lynchburg City School Board. I am Jonathan Bumgarner, a concerned citizen with friends and family working and studying in the Lynchburg City School System. I'm writing about the current response to the current COVID-19 pandemic. While steps are being taken to prevent some spread, such as smaller class, class sizes and hybrid learning with the current numbers, this is just not enough. Using the Virginia Department of Health website as of January the 12th, the number of new cases of COVID-19 in the past 14 days per 100,000 population is 1,011. This far exceeds the 200 cases per 100,000 population to put a school in the highest risk category based on the guidelines made by the CDC. The numbers get, keep getting higher and higher despite the current efforts. Going remote until it's safe for students and staff to return would ideally help lower numbers since education is vital and required. Some people say that children are incapable of catching COVID-19, referencing the CDC website. This is untrue. Children are less likely to get the virus, but can still be asymptomatic and spread it to the adults in their life. So while the current setup may protect the students, what about protecting the staff and the families of students? In-person meetings for teachers have been counseled for the protection of staff. Therefore, in-person instruction should be counseled as well. While this may impact student performance for those who learn better in person, losing someone close to them will also impact their performance. As a final statement, what parameters must be met to go fully online for the protection of students? staff and their families. How can we protect our students, co-workers, families, and friends? We cannot find a perfect solution for this situation, but together we can help protect one another from this virus. Thank you for your time, Jonathan Bumgarner. Thank you, Mr. Bumgarner. Bob? The next comment is from Pamela Minkler, MD. Dear Dr. Edwards and members of the school board, I have said that I am completely stunned by the decision that LCS has made to return to hybrid learning next week. Given the fact that the city's metrics with relation to the COVID-19 virus are significantly worse now than they were when you all made the decision to return to virtual learning the week before Christmas break. 
I have to wonder what factors you've considered in making your decision. I understand that staffing concerns factored in at that time, but it is not completely obvious that with those metrics we will have similar, if not worse, staffing concerns pretty quickly once in-person learning resumes. The message you're sending to teachers and support staff is that they're expendable. You're willing to sacrifice their safety to get kids back in the building. That's a pretty terrible message. I know the schools have been proven to, to not be a source of the virus spread, but I cannot for the life of me understand what's so hard to grasp about the fact that we cannot safely open our schools as long as the virus is spreading like wildfire through our community. In the city of Lynchburg, we clearly aren't there. As a physician, a parent, and a friend of many of your teachers, I urge you to reconsider the decision that you made today. It's reckless, irresponsible, and potentially extremely dangerous. I love Lynchburg City Schools, but I am disappointed in all of you tonight. Sincerely, Pamela Minkler, MD. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Brennan, for reading that. Uh, our next public comment, uh, and please forgive me if I'm not pronouncing this appropriately, but uh, Elizinda Sabalis, and this comment is regarding the reinstitution of the hybrid model of in-person learning. Uh, dear Lynchburg City School Board, I just want to thank the school board for the reinstitution of the hybrid model of in-person learning. Those parents who are not comfortable sending their children to school can certainly continue with remote-only learning. However, many students simply cannot learn effectively sitting in front of a computer all day. Furthermore, the isolation and depression that the remote-only model brings to so many students cannot be understated. The option should remain open for at least two days a week of in-person learning for the remainder of the school year. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Alexander Sabalas. Dr. Brennan. So Dr. Cohen, my next comment is also from Dr. Sabalas, so I will assume that we can- well, Thank you so much. That up, that's okay. Halfway right. <laughs> so my last comment is from Karen Barra. I am concerned about Lynchburg City Schools continuing to do in-person instruction for students. You cannot put a price on a human life. From Karen Barra. Oh, thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. And the last public comment that uh, uh, I have is coming from Carrie uh, Lorimer. And this is a statement from her to the Lynchburg City School Board strongly in disagreement with sending Lynchburg City School students back to school when the metrics are on the rise. That is the last public comment that we received and we do want to let the public know that all persons who sent voice messages that we received, we have heard them and public comments within the time limit permitted. And we want to thank each of you and, and continue to encourage you to send your comments to the board and we, may not be able to read them with the same passion that you do, but we try to do the very best we can to articulate your thoughts. Thank you, public, for participating in our public comments section. We now move to item E in our agenda, which is finance report. Dr. Edwards. I think you mentioned that before coming in and having to do the finance report, so. She's going to update us, Ms. Licata. Good evening. Um, tonight we're going to update you on the financials through November 30th, 2020. The one thing I want to point out is that for, unlike the other months, this month you will see that there was an, two additions to our operating budget that was adopted, and that is our prior year um, encumbrances and also our fund balance return. So when I talk about fund, the prior year encumbrances, those are just open POs. We had some purchase orders that were open towards year end. Actually, it was a little bit before year end and COVID had delayed some of the, um, some of the shipments. And those are things that get sent to our auditors. We give them a list and um, once they get vetted and, they, and it's approved, we get, to, we get to actually carry that over into our current budget. So you will see, our original adopted budget of 98,108,191 plus the additions of the year-end POs 
the fund balance return, and that brings us to our adjusted budget of 101,886,769.97. Um, back to the year MPOs, just to let you know, you know the 1.2 million, 900,000, a little bit more than 900,000 is actually for buses. And again, it was some maintenance projects. They had the EC glass locker replacement that was delayed. And also our fourth quarter billing of unemployment was delayed um, due to COVID. Um, the fund balance return, that's what the board had, we had agreed upon and sent to the city and was approved that gave us the funding to do the bonuses that we were able to do as well as the distance le learning classrooms. So we are, we are busily, getting those purchases, a lot of them have been done and the rest we are working on getting the quotes and, um, and such. The re revenues received to date, we have received 31.21%. Our expenditures to date are 34.01%. And the expenditures including encumbrances is 84.6%. Now we have included the revenue report and the expenditure report that was um, also presented in the finance committee meeting and Basically, I just wanted to point out the revenues are, are, are remaining strong. Um, our sales tax is strong. The, we did get the good news that even with some ADM loss, that we have the no loss funding so that we will not be seeing a de decrease in our state funding. Um, one of the other questions that did come up during that meeting was, are we seeing any type of impact to COVID in our, our current operating budget? And the answer is yes. Um, some of the revenue items that we're seeing, you know, the tuition adult line, you don't, do you not see any revenue at that point. Um, that is set up, but as soon as we are able to go into the jail to provide those services, we would be able to bill those. But right now, we are not providing those services. The bus rental, that was about $200,000. At this time, we, do, we are not having those extra mm -hmm. um, activities. Um, facility rentals, we're seeing a decrease. Um, any money that you see in there right now in that line, um, primarily was down payments from a prior year that rolled over. Um, remedial summer school, we did see that those fund that we, we had experienced a funding loss in that area as well as a decrease in the home homebound instruction. On the flip side, we have we see some savings in our expenditures. Um, not having the bus rental means you do not have the overtime for the bus drivers. You do, you save on fuel. So there's some offsetting. Um, same with facility rentals. You don't have the overtime for your custodial staff, the utilities and such that go along with that. Um, we are seeing savings from not having you know, the, in, the in-person conferences and the travel and all, but we are giving the schools the flexibility to use that in the areas that they need at the school level um, to support the students. And we are seeing, I mentioned the overtime, just over, not just bus driver, we're seeing a, a decrease in the overtime. Substitutes, we're seeing a big savings. Um, overall, just the um, utilities overall. And I had stated a few months ago that we weren't seeing a huge impact on that. And it does make sense. We're starting to see a little bit more of a savings now because when you put July and August, we usually don't have students in there. So we are starting to see that build up. And as well as, um, it's mentioned the, the vacancies, and we have had significant vacancies, and we had the hiring um, delay uh, at the beginning of the year, so we are seeing savings from those contracts. So at this point, we, we, the revenues are good, the expenditures are good. Um, one of the other questions that were brought up in the Finance Committee meeting was, um, was a request for the update on the CARES, and that was submitted. And the one thing that I wanted to point out that has changed, and going with that same, it was the same format we had um, we had presented earlier, just updated. The city cares. We are still at, now at this point, 99.98% spent, and we were actually this, the city was granted a one-year extension, and the only reason we aren't at 100% <clears throat> was two Chromebooks was damaged and returned. So, we're working with the city on that. The number four, the GEARS funds, we did receive additional funding in December, and so that um, is reflected here. We have purchased um, the Seesaw, the Ed Puzzle, so, and some of the MyFi's, so we are starting to work on that. Um, in all honesty, we were working, we were primarily working on the City CARES and the CRF, because those had, they, those had the um, 
short time frame to spend, as well as um, focusing on the on the MIFIs. So we are on the CRF funds. We have spent 99.89 percent. That too would have been 100 percent spent. However, we had a price reduction in some headphones that were ordered, so we now are, we have $1,400 and some change. So we are working to spend that down, but again, we did get a year extension on that. Do you have any questions? All right, this is for discussion and information tonight. Dr. Gupta. <coughs> Thank you for a detailed presentation. Uh, how much uh, savings do you project going forward? Do you have sort of, you're developing that baseline um, I know revenues are strong and expenditures are sort of within the control. So have you projected going forward in the next five months total savings for the whole fiscal year? We have started um, looking at it in, in, the, in the individuals, but not in the totality. So we were looking at the um, fuel and the overtime and things like that. So we are working on that. Um, the big piece is going to be... Um, are those are those vacancies going to get filled? I mean, because I don't I don't want to you know that is prov that is providing some savings, but whether if it's filled tomorrow, then it will not be a savings as compared to if it wasn't filled. So we, it is something. It's a work in progress. I have a follow. Go right ahead, Dr. Gupta. And the other question I had was the encumbrances are about eighty six percent, and expenditures are thirty four. Is that a typo? Because that's a significant like fifty million plus. Well, in encumbrances. At the beginning of the school year, we encourage all the departments that have known expenditures to put in all their purchase orders that they know. I mean, we, we do a blanket purchase order to project out utilities. Um, that's what we still do analysis. The other part is, which is a big piece, is your salaries, it's your contracts. It's, it sets aside what you are contracted, contractually obligated for all your contracted staff. So that's why that number is gonna be significantly higher till date, 86 percent. Mm -hmm. so you're managing salaries in next 14 percent for the next five years. I'm not sure I follow you, I'm sorry. I'll follow up with you. Okay. Dr. Brennan? <clears throat> Mr. Guy, thank you very much for that wonderful presentation for the job that you and your staff are doing. I have one very simple question. When you talk about um, revenue that we're not obtaining under, under dual enrollment, where we have a budget of 150,000, we've not received any of that. Is that related to COVID? Or is that just the timing of when that those funds come through? That's just the timing. We we typically get that in June. Right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Any further discussion? All right. Thank you, Mr. Connish, for your fine work, and uh, Dr. Edwards. Thank you so much. All right. We will now move to our next item in the agenda, and uh, before we uh, move to the consent agenda, I do want to revert. Uh, and make sure that our board clerk uh, will indicate uh, that Dr. Kimberly Sinha uh, is uh, electronically participating tonight. Uh, she's not feeling her best, and uh, her venue would be her address. Thank you so much. All right, we will now uh, move forward with uh, item F, our consent agenda. And again, all of these matters are before us that you have been able to view. Of course, anything can be pulled if you so choose. But in our consent agenda tonight, we have F1, the school board meeting minutes from November the 4th, 2020. F2, school board work session minutes, November the 17th, 2020. F3, school board uh, meeting minutes, December the 1st, 2020. Uh, F4, human resource report, as you see it before you and uh, F5 Human Resources Report Addenda. Uh, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Move that we approve the consent agenda. Uh, motion made by Dr. Carter, seconded by Dr. Gupta. Any further questions or discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Sinha. Uh, very good. Uh, motion uh, is approved. And we will now move to item uh, G1, uh, which is our student representative. Oh. 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 Acknowledge that both building principals are so proud of both of these individuals and the entire school board. And Happy New Year to you all. And tonight we're going to hear first from Jaden Scott uh, from EC Glass, followed by Grayson Arnold from Heritage High School. Thank you both. Well, 
Well, hi, y'all. I feel like I haven't been up here in forever. Um, oh, this is Grayson's presentation. Um, I just wanted to say welcome to 2021. It's a new year, a new start. Um, hopefully getting over 2020, that was a crazy year. Let's try something different for 2021. <laughs> so I first wanted to recognize Isabel and Drew. They um, were winners in the Virginia, um, oh, I can't even see. Well, Isabel won, um, so she was soprano two, and then Drew was bass one. And normally this is held in person, but this year had to be virtual. So that was a brand new thing for everybody, but they still came out and did very well. So shout out to them. And then next we have textbook distribution. Mrs. Wise, our librarian has been out um, countless days in the cold weather, passing out textbooks, um, giving materials to really anybody who needs what they need. So I wanted to say thank you to her because she's been out there faithfully. Um, we will still continue to provide materials to anybody that needs anything. As long as we have it, we'll be there to give it to you. And then winter athletics, this season has started, y'all. Um, and so while fans cannot attend in person, they do have it available to um, stream it live so you can watch from home and you can see everything that's going on. You can find the link um, at EC Glass, their um, Instagram page. It's in their bio, you can subscribe there, and then you can watch all the home games for basketball and wrestling as well. So you'll be able to see everything for there. And then I also wanted to thank Mr. Steven Plunkett. He is a regional, um, a regional manager at Breglin Toyota, and he gave a gracious donation to EC Glass, so we wanted to say thank you to him. All the money that he's giving goes towards our athletic department, um, helping whatever they need help with at the time. So we want to say thank you to him. It's just um, pushing our community further. So thank you, Mr. Plunkett. And our Environmental Action Club, they've been doing it up since COVID started. Mm -hmm. They haven't stopped doing anything. So their park cleanup is still going on. They've had multiple. Um, not only are they continuing that, they have trivia nights and club meetings. So they're still trying to keep everything as, you know, um, as, what's the word I'm looking for? As inclusive, they still want to have everything going on. So that's good for them. And then we have a newer club organization that was started. It's called Lynchburg Students Rise. This was created by students in the community. And their main goal is to provide an all-inclusive and equal space in our Lynchburg city. So the group is comprised of students of all ages. There are some from Glass, there are some from Heritage. And I also want to say that there's a couple from Dunbar, but don't hold me to that. Um, but their next thing is a virtual inauguration party. So they're doing it via Zoom, and you can find um, the application, like the sign-up sheet in, on their Instagram, and you can celebrate with them. It's on January 20th at 12 o'clock. At 12 o'clock? I'm pretty sure. At 12 o'clock, and you can go on there and I don't have a party with them through Zoom. And then our summer residential governor's school, they are taking applications now. This is an opportunity for um, students who would like to go to colleges um, and they'll stay on the college campus and they can um, take classes and they go through seminars and they have mentorships. And those are all the programs that they're doing this year. It's a whole lot. I think it's a great opportunity for anybody who is interested in any of those things. It's really hands-on. It looks super good on applications for college if that's what you guys want to do. But um, I know some people just want to go to have fun, so that's another thing too. Um, they're due to Miss Reynolds. She's in our counseling department by 3 o'clock um, on January 25th. And then, so I wanted to add this little quick links thing. Maybe you just have one question. So this was just something easy. Um, the library website, we are currently doing curbside pickup. Well, pickup for checking out books. So, you know, if you're at home a lot, you get bored, might want to grab something to read, you can come and get something. And then those are the days up there that that's available. And then there's a link that you can sign up for which book you want to check out as well. And then we also have free peer tutoring. 
we know that this is a hard time for students, so we want you to still be able to get all your work done and still be able to get good grades on everything. So peer student, oh, peer um, tutoring is free, and the sign up link is on there as well. And then the March SAT for all of our upperclassmen, that's going on um, in March. The sign up link is on there as well. There are also, um, there are also practice links um, on the EC Glass, um, like the newsletter that came out from Mrs. Wise. And then there's scholarship lists for our juniors, our seniors, anybody wanting to go to college. Now those links up there are really long, so I added some steps up under so that you can see where to get to them because, I mean, I wouldn't want to sit there and write all that down. So <laughs> y'all can just go through there and see. And then lastly, student ID pickup. We took pictures back in November, so your student IDs are here. If you're a hybrid, you can get them in the auditorium um, from 7.15 to 7.45, whichever day you go to school. And then if you are remote students, then you go to the ECG main entrance, and you can get them on the 14th or the 15th, those um, specified times. And that's all. A big thank you to all of the members on the school board because this is a lot of work. I can't stress it enough. Oh. Y'all do amazing work in our community, and I love to see it. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, and I'll see y'all next meeting. Thank you, thank you so thank much, you. Nettis. You're so well Thank you so much. And Grayson? It's always so hard to follow up, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> such a great job. Um, well, I just wanted to say um, I'm Grace Nardo, just in case you didn't know. I'm the student rep for Heritage High School. And I just want to say welcome to the new year. So I just wanted to keep this from the last um, meeting as we are starting hybrid learning again today. Um, I've heard great remarks again. Everyone's very happy and teachers are they're glad to be able to see students. Students are glad to see teachers, so it went off without a hitch today. Um, just wanted to let everyone know that school starts at 7.35 and ends at 1.35 for high school. Um, so yesterday, uh, Beacon of Hope partnered with Lynchburg City Schools to host a, like a <laughs> webinar panel thing for students interested in engineering. Um, and it, w it went off without a hitch. There was a lot of participants and, you know, just students who want to, you know, look at different options that they could go after school. Um, the next slide, please. So Heritage had their induction to National Honor Society this past week. I think, I think it was last week, last week that we had it. And we just... It's just awesome to be able to celebrate students who have those pillars of character, scholarships, leadership, and service. So in the next slide, um, there's just some of, those are some, not all, some didn't have pictures of just the students that were able to be inducted. So just wanted to shout them out and thank them for being so studious and kind and wow. just really representing LCS in a good light. So on to the next one is winter sports. Winter sports is finally here. We're finally able to participate. We're so excited. Um, these are some pictures from last night at the girls basketball game. And then tonight our boys are playing. I believe, I can't remember who they're playing, but they're playing tonight as we speak, I think. So it's just good to be able to be here and be able to play, yeah. So um, this is just some of the upcoming games for the girls basketball team. The, um, so like, so they're basically the same as the boys meets, but um, the glass one, I don't think, either we don't have a JV team or glass doesn't have a JV varsity or JV team. So only varsity will be playing that Saturday on the 16th, but on to the boys, same thing, same dates just about, um, except the boys, JV and varsity will be able to participate. Um, that Saturday, the 16th. Indoor track. As a track, as a track person myself, I'm beyond thrilled to be able to have a season. Short or not, it's just a blessing. And I appreciate all the work that has been put in by the school um, and the school board to allow us to have competition. So, oh, can you go? Thank you. So um, our meets are on Wednesdays for the next three weeks. And then on the following Saturdays of those Wednesdays, pole vault 
and high jumper competing by themselves so that way um, it spreads out and there's less contact. We're able to spread people out more. So on the Wednesdays we'll have um, our running events, shot put, long jump, triple jump, things like that. But the only difference is that. Next slide. And then we have swimming. Our swim team is ready. They've been practicing just along with just just as the other sports have. And those are the meets, I think, for those are all the meets in January, I believe. So we have two at the Jamerson and then two at the downtown YMCA. And then wrestling, wrestling, all of the wrestling meets are being held away at those dates at Rustburg Glass and Liberty High School. The Liberty High School one could possibly get canceled because I know theirs is like their school system's different than ours when it comes to that, but it's on the schedule, so until right now, it's, it's on the schedule. So um, as we are not allowed to have um, spectators, we are streaming sports on nfnhnetwork.com. And then the next two slides will, tell, will help me help everyone find it. So you can either type in nfnhnetwork.com, and then when you get to that page, it'll look like that, and you type Heritage High School. Make sure you hit the Lynchburg, Virginia, because there's like three different ones in Virginia. But once you click that, it'll go to the next slide, and it'll pull up Heritage High School like that. The second way that you can access that is by going to the Heritage High School website. And then if you go to athletics, it's the third, third or fourth link down, and it'll say um, ways to watch online. So then you'll be able to do it that way. Um, we still have Pioneer gear, and you can, um, if you're interested in purchasing some gear, you can call 515-5400 at extension 35016. Okay, so these are some links and phone numbers. Again, it's the, um, the link that you can watch, Heritage Sports. And then I wanted to also include the Chromebooks as we are starting back up hybrid and remote and we're back to you know learning after that long break um, we just want I just wanted to add that in there so um, if there's a problem students can get them handled and then next I just wanted to say thank you to all of the Lynchburg City staffs I'm talking cafeteria workers teachers custodians school board members secretaries principals everyone just and counselors too, you know, as we're going through this troubling time. I just wanted to say thank you from the bottom of my heart and from Heritage High School. Thank you so much for just being here and working for us, for the good, for the safety, and for the greatness of LCS. So thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Brennan would like to make a comment. Just a, a brief comment, mostly to thank both of you for those great presentations, but also I have to second Jaden's comment on Miss Wise, who's a nice lady hand of textbooks, because one of my nieces who's at glass, I don't want to say she forgot to pick up her book, but she was distracted. Right. And she called Miss <laughs> Wise, and she was so sweet about saying, sure, come back the next day and do that. So thank you for pointing her out. Yeah. Sounded like she did a great she job, and thank you both. Right. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, you Jaden and Grayson, and um, you all be careful as you're moving out. Thank you so much, and I've already signed up for that site to be the games, and so Thank it's you. a real neat opportunity to be able to do that. Thank you both very, very much. Uh, we will now move to the uh, item H, um, school board committee reports. And for this, our January meeting, we decided to list uh, these uh, reports here and then if you do not have a report um, you can say you have no report for tonight and then we will uh, govern ourselves accordingly for the next meeting uh, first is the finance committee chair uh, h1 mr gary harvey for information thank you dr coleman thank you sir uh, the finance committee met on tuesday january 5th at 3 30 p.m here in the school board uh, room dr carter <coughs> dr nillis and myself were present as well as non-voting members, Dr. Coleman, Dr. Brennan, and Ms. Morrison. Uh, we were joined by uh, Dr. Edwards and Ms. Lukonich and a member of her staff as well. Also, the board clerk, Tina Day, was uh, in, in attendance. The committee covered several items during our meeting. 
Uh, Ms. Lukonich reviewed the December financial report for the month ending November 30th, as well as updates on the CARES funding. Ms. Lukonich reviewed the sales tax receipts, and these were items that were presented to the board earlier. Uh, sales tax receipts and updates on the 2021 year sales tax and tracking that um, is provided by the state. Uh, two of our main items of focus during the meeting were the LCS staff, uh, step increases that the board has expressed the desire to implement as soon as possible. And the FY uh, fiscal year 2021-22 budget development. Uh, we discussed the fiscal year 2020 and 2021 pay schedules and proposed step increase. Ms. Lakonic shared three options that the board will uh, be presented with to consider. Uh, each of those options will be reviewed at our January work session. Uh, we are also anticipating the state directed requirements that will impact the rollout of the step increases um, and each option and how each option will impact our proposed budget um, will, will, be, um, will be somewhat uh, different. So we'll, we'll be uh, working on that uh, during the next work session. Uh, Ms. Laconage and Dr. Edwards shared the fiscal year 2021-2022 budget development process and updated us on the status. Um, uh, they were in the process of working with individual schools. Some have been complete and some have been in, or were still in progress at the time. Um, and we will be preparing draft budgets, uh, working with uh, the different directors within the administration. Uh, school board work session uh, uh, will begin uh, working on the budget draft at our next work session, which will be January 26th. Um, the next meeting of the Finance Committee will be on February 23rd at 3.30, and I believe that will also be held in this room. So the work session date is the January 19th. 19th. January 19th, I apologize. Mm -hmm. January 19th. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Harvey, uh, uh, for your report. Uh, is there any questions that anyone has for the uh, chair of the finance committee. All right, thank you, Mr. Harvey. Uh, H2, uh, Legislative Advocacy Commi <coughs> Committee, uh, uh, Chair uh, Bill Evans. We did, we did not meet this month. Um, Dr. Brennan and I did meet with um, the Education Foundation. We had our first, I guess it's quarterly meeting. Um, Jody did a great job of kind of just going through background for us of exactly what the Education Foundation is, how they operate. Um, she also had other members of that board on there. And it was eye-opening, a lot of stuff that I'm not sure most people probably know that they do. It's kind of amazing everything they do. And um, I'm very excited about us being able to know more about what they're doing and being able to help them. and vice versa, just to have more interaction with them. So I think it was a step in the right direction and it was exciting. And then next week I am going to the Capitol Conference. Very good. So when we meet next month as a committee, we'll go over how that conference went and everything that was done. Thank you so much, Chair Evans, for that and for your uh, attending uh, the conference and any other board members that may uh, choose to do so. Uh, while we're with the uh, Legislative Advocacy Committee, uh, I would like uh, for the board to briefly um, uh, give thoughts and comments around uh, the School Board Equity and Community Relations Communication Procedures. And um, only in an effort to uh, be helpful and supportive, the board had expressed a desire uh, to make sure that uh, media uh, alerts or press releases pertaining to the board uh, would uh, have some opportunity to, to be reviewed. And so we are not suggesting what that should be as such, but we have come up with a, a means by which to do that. Uh, Ms. Evans? I, I was going to just briefly go over what we had talked about on please? how to do it. it if, a, if there's something that needs to go out to the community, that uh, Mrs. Reeves would send it to me. And the main point of sending it to somebody is trying to be time efficient. Sometimes these need to get out and need to get out quickly. Um, but nothing would be approved 
if it was any new information, if it was anything that needed to be discussed as the board, if it was anything that was new, um, an example would be of a normal one would be just going over what we had already voted on previously and putting that out there. I would still send that to the board to say, hey, FYI, this is coming, so you're not surprised when you see it, but it's nothing that was not already discussed at a board meeting. If it was something that was new that needed discussion, it would be emailed as well with the instruction of, we need feedback on this. How do people feel about it? What do we want to do? So I just want to be clear, nothing is being sent out that was not already approved, discussed, decided by this board, unless the only way something would be sent out that way that was new is if we did have discussion about it. Does that make sense? So anything that she sends me that is not new information She's just asking for it to be read over. I will still send that out like I did last time. Just send it out. This is coming out. This is what we voted on already. Had there been any changes to that, that would not have been sent out until we had feedback. So I don't want anybody to think something's going to go out that people cannot comment on or talk about because that's not true. It's simply going to go out if it's just a repeat of information that the community needs to know. I'm not sure if that made sense or not. But. All right, uh, we, the chair would entertain a brief discussion on this. Uh, you should have a, a piece of paper. It may or may not be legible to your eye, uh, or, or let me say legible, uh, viewable should be the, the better word. Mm -hmm. But thank you, uh, Bill, for stating that. Uh, we are, I am interested, we are interested in hearing feedback from the board, and we don't need to spend a lot of time on this, but we want to just be efficient and effective and making sure the communication that goes out pertaining to the board is accurate and best represents um, what it is that we have discussed in a clear, concise, and coherent manner. Any discussion? Yes, a school board member Morrison. I just have a point about why we're doing this in committee report and not under new business, because this is a change from the way that we have done things in the past. So I'm a little bit confused about why this is occurring at this juncture in the meeting in the meeting in the meeting yeah well the board could certainly put this on the agenda for the future in that way uh, at the present time the committee that we have we have three standing committees the committee that we have uh, whether the board was clear on that at the time that the descriptions were were determined at the Legislative Advocacy and Community Relations Committee reviews all communications uh, that are coming out. I know board members may have different understanding. So in light of some recent occurrences, we wanted to do something to make sure that somebody's eyes were looking at it. The chair is an ex officio member of that committee. So that's why we're bringing it up during the committee piece as a result, uh, rather than new business because we're not establishing a policy of anything. But if it's the pleasure of the board to do that, we can bring this back later. I don't feel uh, that of need to go into further discussion. Uh, Dr. Nillis? Um, so my opinion on this is the board chair's the basically official spokesperson for the board on these kinds of things. Um, I don't see any advantage of running through another committee um, for review or you know, I mean, the, the chair knows what's going on in general. Um, and if there's a question, I, I mean, it's part of why we elected the chair, that we have some confidence in their ability. And I think this is beyond, in my opinion, beyond the scope, at least from when we uh, created this subcommittee. So. Any further discussion? Uh, Mr. Harvey? Yeah, I, I just had a question because uh, hearing hearing um, uh, Ms. Evans, it, 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 it sounded as if Ms. Evans is reviewing this information being sent to her from Ms. Reeves. But it says here that the Legislative Adv 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 Advocacy Committee Chair will send to the committee yeah. for approval. So 
so is the is the committee reviewing this and then voting as a committee for approval? The, yeah, the intent was that uh, the chair, being Ms. Evans, would look at it, share it with the committee. If it was something that required uh, board members beyond the committee to look at, that would be done that way. And then ultimately it would go out. Some of these things are time sensitive. So I just so, shared it with everybody so everyone yeah. could see it. So what, what, having heard the discussion thus far, if you all are okay with it, let me just uh, uh, recognize for the purpose of this meeting as the chair, uh, points are well taken, and I will uh, communicate with Ms. Evans and we will figure out what is the best way uh, to dispatch of this issue that we have brought before us tonight. So you've had an opportunity, I've heard your thoughts, and it's, it's very appreciated, and um, we'll just come back to this at a later point. All right, thank you, Ms. Evans, for the fine work that you are doing. Any other questions for the Legislative Advocacy and, uh, uh, and Community Relations Committee Chair? Thank you so much. Law Regional School Board, um, F, uh, H3, uh, Dr. Sharon Carter. Our next Law School Board meeting will be February the 3rd at 10 o'clock via Zoom. <laughs> Thank you so much. Any questions for Dr. Carter? Thank you for your continued service in that regard. All right, H4, Central Virginia Governor's School, Mr. Gary Harvey. Yes, the uh, Central Virginia Governor's School Board did not re, um, meet uh, in January. Uh, our next meeting is February the 3rd as well at one o'clock and that will be conducted via Zoom. All right, thank you so much. Any questions for Mr. Harvey? All of these groups are outstanding. And lastly, uh, H5, our uh, Regional STEM Academy, Dr. Nillis. The STEM Academy Board has not met this month and will be meeting January 26th, I believe, via Zoom. Uh, the kids are getting back to school um, following the safe protocols. Um, so I have more to report next business meeting. Thank you, Dr. Nillis. All of these are just fascinating entities, and so thank each of you for uh, your fine work in that regard. Uh, with no other questions or discussion, we will now move on. Uh, yes, Dr. Gupta, did you have a, yes. or Mr. Harvey? I wanted to remind Mr. Harvey about that additional seats in Governor's School. I hope that will be on the agenda. That, that would actually come through, through LCS. Point well taken, Dr. Uh, uh, LCS will, we'll, send we'll, we'll look into that. That would be a request that would have to come from LCS to the Gov School. Dr. Gupta, okay. we'll, we'll work on that and see how that best okay. resolves itself. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Thank you all. All right, we will now move to item one, uh, I, uh, and this is unfinished uh, business, and uh, we're going to ask uh, Dr. Edwards to help us to understand who will be sharing with us tonight in our return to learn and return to play updates. And this is um, for information for tonight unless determined otherwise. Dr. Edwards. Thank you. Um, so tonight we actually have probably three parts to this. The first will be a discussion about decision making since there are a lot of questions um, from, the com from the community as to how decisions are made um, and the metrics. And I will go over that. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the academic return to learn um, component. Mrs. Pugh will uh, do that. And return to play, um, although they are not here, our athletic directors from EC Glass and Heritage, Ms. Mason Cup and um, Mr. Knight are not physically present. They did do a video recording um, for the board and for the community, which we will share with you tonight as well. Have we lost the, um... okay. <laughs> I just want to make sure that the community's hearing what we're putting out. Yeah. And Thank you. if there are folks in the lobby, if we ever lose transmission, I would hope that someone will knock on the door and at least say that they can't, we're not live streaming, but. I think that's to alleviate the sound. They'll let us know. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so uh, the return to play will be done by pre-recorded 
um, video from Mr. Knight and Miss Mason Cup from the two, the athletic directors at the two high schools. Um, with regard to um, some of the decisions that were made, I do want to take us back a little bit as a community um, just to make sure that we are all on the same page. At some time during, in December, um, I did a video and some community members say it's not updated. It still has the same dates on it. It was just for information. It was not to be made that I would be doing a video every day with, with the numbers. But the video talked about the metrics that we use. And at that time, I wanted the community and the board and our families and our staff to understand that we're looking at what's going on outside in Lynchburg City Schools community, but also what's going on inside Lynchburg City Schools. Um, in addition to the video and the information, I do want the community to know that every Tuesday um, I sit on a standing call with other superintendents in the area, private school directors, uh, college and university personnel, daycare, members from Centra and Dr. Gately. And the whole purpose of the conversation is, is all COVID conversation. Dr. Gately gives us an update on COVID in the community, vaccinations today. Um, Dr. Lewis, uh, Dr. Elliott from Centra let us know what's happening in the hospitals and you know, uh, if public school superintendents we share, private schools share, the colleges share um, what we're experiencing. And that's every Tuesday, just so that we're all on the, on the same page. But getting back to the metrics, um, and I know that I shared that we had several um, that were city metrics, and that's our 14-day case. And, you know, I have my own little graphic, which I keep for myself, and I, and I update um, daily. And I think at the time that I made the video, and, and my numbers for this, this graphic go all the way back to November 9th, right, shortly after we, we had everybody in for in-person learning, we, had, we were at 326 cases per 100,000 at that point. We were in the red. And since then, we have never been in any other color but red um, when, we, when we return to learn um, and even slightly before that. So I do keep track of those 14-day, um, I'm sorry, the, the cases per 100,000. Then our positivity rate. Um, and I know that there's been a lot of guidance and there's been a lot of change to guidance. Um, and I think sometimes people share guidance that might have been old some, the, without looking at revised guidance or guidance from different groups. So um, there's guidance on the Virginia Department of Health website. There's guidance on the CDC website. There's guidance on AAP. Um, so there is a lot of information out there. Um, but as school systems, we work with our local health director. We work with VDH. That is how um, it is designed for us as public school systems to work with. And um, in saying that, we work directly with Dr. Gately, and we use the information that is on our VDH website, which is specific to not only the Central Health di uh, District, which is all of us, including the counties, but Lynchburg. So the Lynchburg numbers for positivity rate way back on November 9th were at about 6.1, and they have steadily increased in the community um, since then. And then looking at the change between two sets of seven days to see whether or not on average you're increasing or you're decreasing, that one tends to vary a lot, um, and it's information that we also consider. And again, it has varied from the seven-day average from the previous seven-day average way back in November being negative 38.6% change, which is good because you want that change to be negative, um, to exactly opposite at 37.1% up um, with that change. So those are some of the city metrics. Then we started putting our metrics in an effort to be transparent. So I do not want anyone to think that the people who work together to make any of these decisions are trying to hide anything. All of the people involved in the decisions show up to the buildings as well. Myself, principals, we all come to work. Everybody involved in the decisions has a family. Um, many people have kids. Many people have their elderly parents living with them. Some of them have health conditions themselves. We are people like everybody else in this community with the same concerns, the same worries, the same fears, 
and the same passion for children that everybody has. So I don't want you to think there are a bunch of people um, somewhere hidden that are making decisions in a safe zone when it really is people who do show up um, every day and, and have these conversations. So we did put on our website, and I will give credit to Bedford County because they were doing it. We stole it from them. We put on our website what our numbers were, and we have been doing that, um, our daily numbers. We update them at noon, so it is as accurate as noon, and I have had people say, oh, I know by the end of the day something has happened. It won't show up till the next day. We have to have a time to do that um, on our website. So that information is available of our total positive cases um, on our website, and it's for the entire division. It includes staff, it includes students, and for reasons of HIPAA, we don't identify or give too much identifying information because it, it is people's private information. Um, and at that point, uh, what I said we were looking at is our um, five-day average, and it's not five consecutive days because we are not here on Saturdays and Sundays, but we do look at that average, and we tend to see more um, on the start of the week because of Saturday and Sunday is factored into, the, into that, those numbers than we do at any other time. Um, before the Thanksgiving break, many community members emailed myself and this board and asked, would we take time off in light of the fact that some families may be traveling and, and spending time and that there was a, predicted, a prediction that COVID might spread <coughs> due to the Thanksgiving holiday. Many of the colleges made some decisions about not returning until later. Um, and at that point, we had no data to suggest, even though the predictions were real. We are not saying that the predictions weren't real. But as LCS, we stayed open. So we left Tuesday before Thanksgiving, came back Monday after Thanksgiving. And we did see an increase in our numbers. Um, that following week, we saw six, two, and four cases and then it, it started to decrease. But six at that time was a high for us following that short Thanksgiving week. In December, we came up to the holiday break and I asked that, well, let me back up. Um, prior to that, prior to the December work session, we did have a case where the other school metrics came into play. Um, in addition to our positivity rate, we look at absenteeism, staff absenteeism, student absenteeism. The two big factors are not only the number of positive cases, which could be two or three, but the number of quarantine cases, which could increase upwards to, I think at some point we had a high of maybe 45 to 50 folks being quarantined. And again, not just the number, but where. 45 cases being quarantined in small school, like PC Miller takes out the whole school. 45 cases across the division, might look different. So we look at where um, those quarantine cases are. And then we start to look at whether or not we have what I call staff or student critical. And are we looking at a grade level possibly shifting to remote, a wing of a hallway shifting to remote, an entire school shifting to remote, a department, the admin building, or transportation, and I have said on numerous occasions that transportation is the one area that crosses every school. So if we are at staff critical with transportation, it may be difficult to get all of our kids in um, into the hybrid learning setting. Uh, early in um, December, we contacted. We were contacted by one of the principals. We meet with the principals and work with them regarding their staffing. They are the first line of defense whenever a staff member reports that either I'm quarantined, I need to care for a staff or, uh, a family member, or I tested positive, or um, my kid is sick, I have the flu. I'm, there are other reasons to be out that affect the absenteeism. And we ask our principals to work with their staff. We do ask our staff if you are not feeling well, if you are sick, to stay home. We work with the principals, and as much as we feasibly can, we do offer options for teleworking if, it, if it's possible um, for a staff member to do that. So those conversations with building principals and department leads go on regularly. Um, we had one with the principal um, at Heritage Elementary School in December. We got to a point where we did not think we had enough staff members to safely supervised children at Heritage Elementary. 
All right, so numbers weren't high everywhere else, just there. And we did shift to remote at that school for a short period of time while we managed the quarantine um, and positive cases and, and other abs absences. And then they returned. Um, shortly after that, we had it in transportation. And that's when I brought it to the board because now we're not talking a grade level, a wing in a building, a you know the, the science department or a school. We were talking the whole entire division in um, at our emergency board meeting that we had in December because we did not have enough staff members in transportation to safely um, run our transportation department. And we did shut down for that week um, right before the holiday break. The work session that we had was a different story. That was to take a pause and acknowledge to our community, many of whom uh, emailed again and said, we know what you did during Thanksgiving. The board did not have any conversation around whether or not to entertain. Do we want to take um, shift to remote after the holiday break? And would you please just have that conversation with the boards based on what you saw after Thanksgiving, both in the community and even in your own schools? And that's what we did. We, at our work session, we looked at holiday break. We do not have restrictions on our staff. We do not tell our staff you cannot travel. Uh, we do not say if you travel to visit family members, depending upon where they are, you have to have a 14-day self-quarantine. We do not have any of those restrictions. Um, and that's concerning for some. And that was one of the reasons to have the discussion. We also know that staff, or staff and families may be having families travel to Lynchburg. So even if I wasn't traveling, you know, I may have some family visit me. So we took a pause to say the numbers at that time were, were high and we were predicting that they may be high after break. Do we want to shift to remote as a precaution um, for the first, and, and the proposal was for two weeks, for the first two weeks upon returning from break. Um, a discussion was had, a decision was made that we would do it for one week and that it would be for the week of January 4th to January 8th, just that week, which defaults back to our hybrid learning starting at the close of business on January 8th with kids coming back physically to hybrid learning on January 12th. Um, so those were, that was a decision that we made to get to, um, to this point. When we return, so let me share numbers with you. On January 4th, we captured all of the numbers for positive rates for everything that we missed for the two weeks that we were on break. And January 4th, we had 19 positive cases. Um, and I think we did 64 investigations, and that's just people reporting, and then we have to follow up, and ended up with 45 quarantines across the division. We also had a meeting on January 4th, which was a Monday with the building principals, and we said, okay, we have numbers, but you have people. You have assignments. You know what rooms you're trying to cover. Um, where are we and are we at staff critical anywhere? And we're at staff close, right? We weren't at staff critical where we had to make that call to say shut down a building. But we were at, if you know, just two more or three more or four more people are out, I'm not sure I will be able to cover um, everybody in a couple buildings, just a, a, a couple buildings. That's not to say the numbers weren't high. That's just one of the metrics that we looked at. So we continued with, at the end of January 8th, we would go back to um, remote learning. And all last week, we asked building principals, let us know. Keep an eye on your staff. We asked folks, tell your, call your building principal, your administrator, let them know. We included folks who were just sick, flu, child was sick, some people's daycare closed, and they couldn't come in. All of that factored into where we were so that, um, and I think it was really up until Sunday. And we understand we're trying to give parents as much time and notice as possible, as well as working with the building principals. So we did um, end up opening um, today back for hybrid learning uh, with our kids. So our numbers last week on the 4th started with 19 positive cases. Um, that was Monday the 4th. By Tuesday, we had six. By Wednesday, we had two, Thursday, we had two, and by Friday, we had one. And then we enter into this week. Yesterday, we had nine. Today, we have three. Um, so we are constantly, and that's the entire division in terms of positive cases. 
we are constantly monitoring that five day average. Um, during the week that we were out, January 4th to January 8th, our five day average was also in the red, as well as the city numbers, um, the positivity rate, it was all in the red during the week that we were all in remote learning. Right now, um, yesterday, our five day average was down to four, today it's down to 3.4. So we are in what I call the yellow for Lynchburg City five day average. The community is still in the red, right? Let, I'm not trying to hide anything. The community is very much in the red. So with regard to did we do anything different? Did we use any different protocols? We did not do anything different. We did not use any different protocols. We are continuing to use our metrics. We did talk with um, building principals again, and that conversation goes on. It's not just Mondays, it's any time that they feel like they need to give us a call, anytime a staff member feels like um, they, would, they need to give their principal a call or um, anyone in LaTanya's office as well. Uh, so that is how we make the decisions to do that. Um, as I said before, it, we're trying to balance. And if you listen tonight, you will know there is no one thing that this division can do that will satisfy everyone. There is no one thing that I could say that I could get up from this table and say, everybody is happy with the decision that I made. Um, we have a lot of families who are concerned, and I will tell you, today I looked and it's, we hit a, we hit a new high. We're at 1,011 per 100,000 positive cases in Lynchburg City. We're at a positivity rate of 20.3 today. So when I have residents, family members, staff members who say, I'm concerned and we should just be remote only, that's real. We hear you, that's a real concern as well. Um, when I have family members who say, but we need you, our kids are suffering, they don't learn as well as they do when they're in front of you, that's also real. That's also a concern and we also hear you. We have family members who are concerned about the health of their children, not just the physical health due to COVID, but the social, emotional, and mental health due to the lack of interaction in school. That concern is real for that family and we hear you. Um, and we add to that the, the other complication or the other uh, concern that we talked about is where does extracurricular and athletics and um, other activities for students fall into this? And again, we heard from family members that says sports and athletics or participating in the environmental club is something that my child helps my child thrive. If you take that away, that's not going to be good for my kid. For that family, that concern is real and we hear you and we hear other folks who say how can you even consider a basketball game how can you even consider wrestling what are you thinking about swimming and for those families that concern is real so i'm not here today to debate whether or not people's concerns as they are expressing them to us are real legitimate valid if you're talking to me and you have passion about your child, your family, then yes, it is real, it's valid, it's legitimate, and I'm hearing you. But I would say as this board, and I'm very supportive of all of you, when we hear all of that, we still have to make a decision. Um, and the best decision that we possibly can, weighing all the factors at the time that we can with the information that we have. And we are doing the best that we can. And we are not going to get it right for everyone. Um, it's just the decision that we, we make with the best information that we have. We are educators at heart. So all of our teachers, our staff, the number one thing we love are the kids. We all got into this. None of us signed up to be health professionals except for our nurses. But the rest of us signed up because we love kids. We love interaction. We love the aha moments. We want them to be successful. So no one in Lynchburg City Schools is making decisions for the sole purpose so that kids would not be successful. We want our kids to be healthy. We want our kids to thrive. 
But we also recognize in our LCS family, our kids and staff. We want our staff to thrive. We want our staff to be healthy. We want our staff to do their best as well. And again, we have staff who are, they want to be here five days a week. I have staff who, if I said we open up five days a week, they're like, yes. And for them, that's real. And I have staff who are afraid. And for them, that's real too. And what we're trying to do as a division is not divide this community. If nothing else, the pandemic has done that by itself. We need to unite this community. And we need to understand that no one is coming here with malice at heart, ill will. We're all just trying to make the best decisions that we can for our students. Um, you heard some information about failure rates. If you look at newspapers across the country, I open up the news, VSBA does a news thing. <laughs> Everything you see is schools are open, schools are closed. They we're shifting remote, we're not shifting remote. Athletics is on, athletics is off. Kids are failing, kids are not failing, kids are thriving. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. That doesn't excuse it, but that does make it look like this is not just happening in Lynchburg City Schools and shame on us that it's just happening here. Educators are concerned everywhere about learning loss, life loss, everywhere, everywhere. We're concerned about our babies, we're concerned about our older students. There was a good point made. It's not just about the failure rate, right? Mm -hmm. It is about the A student who is now a C plus right now because they're not thriving. That is equally as important to all of us. So I just asked this community, and I've, I've you know, received a lot of emails, uh, you know, seeing social media, um, talked to people on the phone, uh, and I, I'm just asking us all to just be understanding. The one thing that I did say to a parent who reached out to me and said, my kids have been remote and I wanna send them back, I signed up to send them back, um, for a second semester, but I'm not sure, and I don't want to do the wrong thing. And I said, trust your gut. These are your children, and whatever you decide to do, that's the right thing, and we will be here. So if you decide to stay remote, we're going to do the best we can with you because we know you're making good decisions for your kids. If you decide to send them in hybrid, we got our arms open, we're waiting because that's the best decision that you're making for your kids. We are not forcing anyone to send their children to school for our hybrid learning, it's a choice. We're not forcing anyone to be remote, it's a choice. We have our staff, they are dedicated, we are doing the best we can to minimize the spread of COVID. And you've heard very, very th various things about kids and spread. Kids don't spread, they're super spreaders. Kids um, don't get it, they do get it. And the science is always evolving with children. And again, those weekly meetings, uh, one of the things that Dr. Gately shares with us is when we look at the positivity, um, positive cases in Lynchburg, he breaks it apart by age. So we can see which age groups, that data is available, we can see which age groups have a higher rate of COVID. And children do have a lower rate. It's not zero, but they do have a lower rate. So what we have done is yes, have we limited the adult adult in person as much as possible in an effort to preserve the adult child interaction? Yes. So if someone said to me, oh, well, you don't wanna do in-person faculty meetings, you don't wanna do in-person adult principal meetings, adult uh, uh, senior leadership meetings, but I'm trying to preserve any kind of contact that we could have in a safe environment that's adult to child. Mm. So if I could keep my teachers as safe as possible so that they can do what they need to do for children, that is what we are attempting to do. And again, I have teachers who have requested to telework. I have uh, staff members who have conditions and we have made alternate um, arrangements for. Those things do exist. I don't want anyone to be misled that we are forcing everyone to, to come to work. That is not the case here in Lynchburg City Schools. As I would say, that's probably not the case at the hospitals, the grocery stores, or anywhere else 
where COVID is. So as a community, and given all of the concerns and all of the various groups, I just would like to say to the groups that we hear you and we understand that what you're saying is real. We hear all of you. We hear all of you. But to make a decision, we as a collective body, and I say we with the board, we with the administrative staff, the principals working with their staff, the department leads working with their staff, transportation department, we're trying to do the best we can for students. So again, I keep my metrics, not trying to hide anything. We report it out, not trying to hide anything. There is light at the end of the tunnel. We are in 1B in the vaccination world, educators. If you looked at the map, there's a new thing on VDH. It shows which communities are in 1A. That's us right now. Which ones have shifted to 1B? The southwest and parts of Northern Virginia have shifted to 1B. Those health departments are now vaccinating teachers and educators. We're next, we're close, right? We're next, we're close. Talk to Dr. Gately about that. We've surveyed our staff, um, again, our student services offices, along with our wonderful, wonderful nurses, have surveyed our staff. There are options that we are exploring. Uh, we don't know if they're all feasible. We have uh, nurses who could, they're qualified to administer the vaccine should they want to, fill out paperwork, a whole bunch of stuff. But remember, the vaccine has to be um, in a freezer. Uh, there are certain conditions. So we, we may not be able to do that here at Lynchburg City Schools. Um, our hospital is working with us. They look like they're working with pharmacies to vaccinate staff. And that being said, our staff, we're looking at just from cursory surveys, about 50% of the people said, okay, I think I might take that vaccine, 50%, all right? So we're not out of the woods, but there's light at the end of the tunnel. And we are not in a position right now, at the current moment, where we're saying it's mandatory if you wanna work here, you gotta get the vaccine. We are not there in Lynchburg City Schools. And I don't know if anybody's there, any, any um, employer is there, because again, the concern about whether or not I should take the vaccine, a person should take the vaccine, if that's their fear, again, for that person, that's real. That's real, and I have to respect that as well. So I said a lot because I've heard a lot over the last couple of days and weeks, and um, you know we've been tasked to respond to a lot, um, and that's from community, family, and staff. Uh, but I want to make sure that everybody understands that we have not done anything different in our plan than we did when we made a decision that HES needed to be remote at that time in December. Uh, it is the same decision. And we will continue. If I, tonight a principal calls me and says, I can't do it tomorrow, we'll make that call. We're not going to be put people at risk um, for that. Okay, did I cover everything that you needed to know <laughs> about numbers, stats, athletics? Oh, no, I didn't. Athletics. Let's talk a little bit about the, that call. For the general how athletics should, should uh, function, whether or not we're in phase three or phase two enhanced for athletics, when the entire division shifted, so did athletics. But pre-COVID, athletics and the, the calls whether or not a game would be played, a wrestling match would go on, uh, the softball feels too soggy to just have that game, or the opposing team has problems, is done at a school level. And it has been done at a school level with a wonderful team of the athletic directors, the coaches, and the building principals. They are following the similar things as we are following. So if a team as did one of our opposing teams, um, has a COVID-related issue that says, hey, we gotta take a pause. They're gonna take a pause. They're gonna make that call. It's not gonna be at a big division level unless we're shifting into a different phase. Um, and we saw that this week. We had a lot of excitement going in, ready, ready, ready. And then we saw that we had to take a pause. Part of the pause was the other school division. Part of the pause was us. There's no controlling that except to respond to that. Um, and I do know that we need to, at the school level, 
make sure that both not only the athletes who are participating but their families also know yeah. i'm going to call that one out that we need to do a, a good job mm -hmm. of doing that but we are trying to provide these opportunities for children um, and our athletes um, but we're also trying to do it in a safe way um, and we're doing it in conjunction with our colleagues in the um, Seminole district which is the district that we participate in so yes we support our children in extracurricular activities and athletics. And yes, we also monitor them for COVID related issues, them, their coaches, and everybody involved um, with that as well. Now I think I answered all of the <laughs> questions that you may have had. All right, uh, thank you, Dr. Edwards. And we will now uh, uh, move into discussion. Uh, the struggle is real, board. I think the superintendent has helped us to appreciate that. I wanna thank each of you for the countless hours of reflection and uh, interactions about this matter. And so division-wide, we are in phase three. And the superintendent and staff have the opportunity, uh, school by school, grade level by grade level, part by part, et cetera, to deal with that on an individual basis. And that will remain unless this board determines otherwise. Uh, the floor is open for discussion at this time, Dr. Gupta. So in your discussions with Dr. Gately, has he shared the vaccination timeline for our faculty staff? Yeah, we're, this area is still in 1A, which is the educators are in 1B. I think they are working with our local pharmacies and hospitals to determine um, sites to the degree that the Lynchburg community could self-administer, and I kind of alluded to that a little bit if you have. Um, nursing staff or, or uh, medical staff who can administer, they are willing to work with us. We do not have an exact date yet, except to say we're close. Uh, Ms. Morrison? I have a, a question about phase three and phase two. Mm -hmm. In phase three, we were in remote. Phase two. Yeah. Phase, phase two, two remote. Phase hybrid. two, and we're now in phase three, which hybrid. means that we are in hybrid. Hybrid, yes. Right. Okay. So. Let's reiterate that so that everybody is clear. Phase two is remote only. Phase three is hybrid with our, our cohort groups. All right, uh, Dr. Carter. And Dr. Um, Edwards, I'm glad that you just explained that we are hearing people because we are, and everyone's opinion is valid because it's where they are and where they're coming from and from their experience. But I also want to bring attention to a lot of the staff and the employees of Lynchburg City Schools. Their concerns with the guidance about the time for isolation and the time for yeah. quarantine. Mm -hmm. And some are saying that you, they're seeing people come back that were positive, tested positive for COVID quicker than people are coming back when they're quarantined. And I know that the VDH has changed or lessened the time. So where are we? Okay. So and especially when we have this paycheck, I forgot the name of FFCRA. it. FFCRA. FFCRA. Yeah. Yes, I'm worried about that. Um, yes. So um, with regard to the change, so I think it was December 7th that the um, CDC made a change in if you, if you had the um, test and it was negative, you would come back seven days earlier. Or, or, and I don't have all that in front of me, so I don't want to mess it up too bad. But I do know that we had, our team had a conversation about whether or not we were going to go to that seven day, shorten that window a little bit to the seven days instead of the 14 and 10 days that we had. And at that time, and I, in December, um, and, and with discussion with, with the health director, Lynchburg City, we did not because it's an option. The gold standard is still the 10 and 14 days. There is an increased risk and um, the percentage is on, the, on their website and, and it's, I'm not even gonna give you the number. So if you shorten the window, the time to come back, you're doing so knowing that you're also increasing the, the risk a little bit. And at that point, we did not want to take the risk of shortening the window and, and having folks um, come back with that risk in terms of that. There, is, there was some concern, and, um, and I will say when we came back from break, the counting mm -hmm. might be slightly off because we were off for two weeks. And um, there are some cases where we need to check 
if I came back from break on December, I'm sorry, January 4th, and I reported on January 4th that, hey, I had symptoms or I tested positive, or whatever the case may be, if I don't give any timeline to, and yet yeah, I was on the 22nd of December, which is where the clock should start it, the person doing the intake might start that clock on the 4th. And that's what we need to make sure that, that when the intake is being done, that staff who are both given the information and receiving the information for the people who are over break, because uh, that's the timeline where it's a little bit more fuzzy. During the week, it's a little easier because usually it's, I felt bad today and we can start that, that timeline. Um, it is something that we can certainly revisit. I think we talked about that before if Lynchburg City Schools wants to go to the shortened timeline standard um, to, to do that. Now, I will say this, that our contact tracing team is the team that was here before contact tracing existed. None of these people were trained to be contact tracers. None of these people were, you know, it, it's just the folks we already had. So they're doing the best that they can and they're receiving the information on the honor system from the people who are giving the information. We have to trust our employees when they say, this is when um, I felt sick, or this is when symptoms start, or these are the people that we were around. So in some of those cases, if, if we're getting that Crystal came back before Amy came back, and we know that, then those folks should be letting their supervisor know so that we can go back and look at that data and make sure that we, we didn't make a mistake or that it wasn't misreported. And if it was misreported or there was a mistake, then how does that, how is that rectified? Yeah, then we gotta go back and have that conversation with said person. But if you think, let me say that, if you think that your information is incorrect or if you were the, the person either doing the intake or receiving it, the quickest way to get it resolved is to talk to one your building administrator or whomever you directly reported it to and then contact, uh, you know, they will be in contact with someone in the uh, contact tracing team, which is out of Latonya's office, school nurse, the nurse coordinator, or director Brown. Um, sometimes we get information, but we don't know the who, and it slows us down with that. So if you're out there and you feel like that, please let us know. So, uh, well, Go ahead, Dr. Carter. So how does that look like? So if someone is, do you, do you have an example of how many days someone will have to take off? I'm, I'm going to have to pull up the actual... So well, I'm I looking don't. at the VDH website, and according to this, it's kind of um, like if you can't stay. So who says if you can't stay? It says if you are unable to stay home for 14 additional days, you already have to stay until the person you're exposed to is cleared. And then it says for the additional 14 days. And how many people have all those days? But it says... Uh, if you don't, then after 10 days without testing, you can go, or after seven days with a negative PCR or an antigen test performed on or after day five. So the so, seven-day piece is the piece we did not yeah. adopt. So the 10-day piece is the piece that's, that's in play for us. But that seven-day, neg I've tested negative PCR test, that's the part that at the time when that came out on Dece in December, we did not adopt that. We stayed with the original... 10, 14 yes. day, so uh, 10 for a positive and 14 for quarantine. And then the, the guidance changed from the seven to 10, and we discussed that um, and decided to stick with the 10 and 14. We did say that we would go back and look at that, and based on the numbers, you know, maybe make the change to, to go to the seven and 10 day. Um, but we looked at that and reviewed that, and we are still still with the, the guidance from CDC and VDH to stay with the 10 and 14 day. Thank There's you. One more, if yeah. I could, please. So, um, so everyone or people that took sick leave before the, the um, FFCRA expired, they were covered or they're, they received some... They if they received, qualify. If they qualify, if okay. They qualify. But now that extension hasn't been approved yet that's what we're working on now oh so because we, the okay. ffcra leave expired as of december 31st and if you you look at even even as kim came in and said remember we had to spend down by december 30th and then we got notice on december 31st oh you're getting an extension 
So um, we are looking at, and, and we, we anticipated that that was going to expire because when it came out, it had an end date on it. So it wasn't like they, when they originally put it out, they didn't have an end date. Whether or not they were going to extend it or what the, the, the government would do is what we were waiting on. So right now, my team is looking into that. We are not trying to harm folks. Um, by any means, but we also don't want to put people at risk. And we don't want to ensue any kind of panic based on folks who think, well, they're just going to come, come to work sick now. Um, and, and again, this is not something that's unique to just, they just did FFCRA out at Lynchburg City Schools. I mean, this is, is all around with the constant changes that we're experiencing. So if we go, if we do that, you know, will people, if they qualify, will it be retroactive to January? That I don't know. You're asking me questions on something I haven't had time to sit down and investigate all the rules and the if thens and all of that, because um, um, I don't have all of that guidance in front of me and what that means for Lynchburg City Schools. I do realize, as chair, that it looks like at least a third of the board is concerned about this matter. Uh, the Evans, Morrison, and Carter. And so I do ably hear the superintendent and the deputy superintendent acknowledging all the dynamics. Uh, uh, before uh, Dr. Brennan, uh, I think I believe I see Bill's hand. Uh, Ms. Evans? Yeah, I just wanted to, I mean, I realize that y'all have to look into it and do, but I, th I think without a doubt for our teachers, if, if you're at work and you're exposed and you have to quarantine, <clears throat> um, I do have a real concern if somebody doesn't have two weeks of sick time. I, I don't think that's on them to come up with or take a doc to pay for that. I think we really, as a division, have to look at that and say, how are we going to make sure, even if this does not come through, I think that's on us to figure out how to help employees that are put into quarantine due to the job they're performing for us. So I think it's a big area that we need to make sure we stay on top of for teachers. I think the, the thing that I don't want to get missed is whenever this happens, and, and we, we are really experiencing it in this building, the first thing we say is, okay, you might have been exposed. You guys saw that I was, I was quarantined, right? right. The first thing is, can you telework? Can, the, can you still perform your duties? Most of our teaching staff can just you okay. know, still work remote. Right. That's our first option. Okay. Like, that has always been our first option. But there are some positions. I can't just sit there and say everybody can telework. There are some positions right. that you, it's, it's impossible to telework. So that's our first option. And we did have a list of different options, that first this, then that um, folks could use. Many people who are um, quarantined but not symptomatic and can still um, perform their duties have been trying to do their duties at home um, and, and working as best as they can to do that. So I guess I'm just saying for the ones that that is not possible for, I think we as a board need to look at what we do for those people because I do think that's our responsibility. So noted, Ms. Morrison and then Dr. Brennan. I, I just, I think the contact tracing has been added, uh, adds a lot of responsibility to a small group of people. And my question is, do we need to look at giving them some help? Yes. To fulfill those responsibilities. We, ironically, we hired a contact tracer um, to assist an outside person and on their first day they were quarantined. So, um, you just, you, and we are looking at getting more. I think um, that's important. It, it, yes, we yeah. are looking at getting um, more staff to assist. And we recognize that, you know, it's a fine line because it's a privacy issue that, you know, it's, it's not just anonymous numbers, it's people that you're asking questions about. So yes, we did have a plan to use some of our CARES money, um, which is, it's, you can do that to get some more folks to, to, um, out in that area. Thank you. Dr. Brennan? Um, I just want to thank Dr. Edwards for her comments before. I think you've covered a lot of questions that people have had, and, and I know we've gotten many emails, and I think the comment about how it really is divided, everyone is passionate about an opinion on one side that would just totally understandable. I mean, the number of cases is large, the risk is large, all the other issues, it really is very important, but you laid that out so well. And I think just a couple of quick comments. One, as you said, this is not Lynchburg. This is national. This is everywhere. You know, everyone is seeing the same challenges and trying to deal with it. And, and it's hard. It's just hard across the board. 
But the other point that I would like to make is, as you said too, you can't say that Lynchburg City School doesn't care because you know, the effort that is being put into this by the administration, by the staff is unbelievable. And just talking about contact tracing, I, I talked to Dr. Gately to clarify this, but as, as I think, I'm sure you know, they've given up on contact tracing. They're just looking for outbreaks to identify an outbreak. We are still doing what the health department can no longer do, and it's taking a ton of time. So I think to help with that is huge because the amount of effort that, are, that staff is putting into contact tracing and not education is, is, a, is, a, is a huge problem. Um, and then lastly, I think that the, the, the issue about the COVID paid leave relief is really important. I mean, from a public health point of view, you don't want someone who's sick to come to work because they can't afford to take the time off. And we all understand that if someone can do their role by telemedicine, where that's perfect, but if you can't drive a bus and you're quarantined, you can't do that by telemedicine, then we need to support those people because, we, because it's the right thing to do. And plus, we don't want them to come to work when they're sick and exposing people. So that's been a principle since the beginning and the PPP initially addressed that. So I hope that we will too. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Dr. Gupta. I just want to echo what Ms. Evans and Dr. Brennan said. You know, the bus drivers, the custodial staff, the, the uh, our kitchen people, they, they cannot work remote and that we don't want them to go without a paycheck when they are quarantined. So that should be the utmost first priority to make sure that we are fulfilling our obligation to those frontline employees. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. Dr. Nillis or Mr. Harvey or Kim Sinha, uh, let us know when you want to chime in. Dr. Nillis. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate um, Dr. Edwards explanation and what factors are being looked at. I mean, it'd be nice that you could have this little recipe to go through about, you know, based on these numbers, this is what we're going to do. But, you know, ultimately it comes down to keeping the staff safe and getting the kids in because um, there's, if the kids aren't coming in, it's bad for them. Um, and you want to keep the staff safe when the kids are coming in. So I think uh, protocols that that uh, that are in place seem to be pretty effective. Um, my impression is the cases in the in the school division are really from outside the community. Um, and there's not not a lot of in school transmission. I think I recall Dr. Gately made that comment that the schools are not centers of transmission. Generally, now that was in November, but yeah, I think that probably still holds holds true. And uh, I do want to throw my support behind um, making sure our employees, uh, you know, if they are being quarantined, it's uh, we need to do what we can to help help them. So, thank, thank you, you Doctor Nellis. Mr. Harvey, I, I support what other board members have said. Um, I, I echo. <coughs> Uh, the concerns about our staff who are, are calls to quarantine, um, making sure that that um, they are their livelihoods protected. I think that's I think that's critical for us. And and I applaud Dr. Edwards and her entire staff for what you've been doing, um, especially um, in the light of some of the correspondence that we see from members of the community. Um, it truly is something that there is a tremendous amount of care put into these decisions. So I would encourage members of our community, please, please, please don't insinuate that we that we don't care, or that we're not paying attention, or that or any of those negative things because that is not the case at all. And I think it's pretty obvious with uh, Dr. Edwards' explanation of the amount of care that goes into making these decisions. Thank you, Mr. Harvey. We're leading with care. Dr. Sinha, did you have a comment to make? All right. Dr. Edwards, you okay. can move on to the All next right. piece. Well, that was a lot to say about this medical side of it, and I just want to quickly turn it over to Ms. Pugh to go over some of the academic side of it, and then we'll get to um, Ms. Mason Cup, who is waiting on the screen. <laughs> 
<laughs> Thank you. Mm. Um, as, as we've heard several times tonight, um, our students, we have returned to phase three and we had students back in hybrid learning today in our buildings and from our student reps, we heard that things at least at the high school went well. Um, we've heard some good things from other uh, schools as well. Uh, we are continue to be on track to include some additional hybrid students for semester two, which starts next Tuesday on January the 19th. Um, we have approximately an additional 500 students, pre-K through 12th grade, plus in alternative education settings that um, should be joining us for um, hybrid during semester two. Um, keep in mind that we're still in uh, semester one this week, and so we, we have schools that are still reaching out to families if they have open spaces to see if they um, have students that they are, are willing and wanting to, to return to the hybrid setting. Um, but we also need to keep in mind that we do have uh, some hybrid students whose families would like to move them back to remote. So that number, while I say it's approximately 500, that number is probably going to fluctuate over the next um, couple of weeks. So we just need to keep that in mind. Um, I have specific numbers by elementary, middle, and high school, um, Dr. Brennan, if you, um, that, that you requested, and I can certainly go over those tonight, or I can email, me, email them to the board if that's what you would prefer. Thank you so much, Ms. Pugh. I think you could email them, it would be great. Can you give us an idea, and I know you said the numbers fluctuate, so maybe there's not an answer to that currently, but a percentage of students who are participating in hybrid versus virtual from, from the earlier this year to what you are predicting so far? Certainly, so when we look at semester one hybrid, roughly about 55%, and again, that's um, K through 12. Um, for semester two, we're looking at the increase bringing us to roughly around 62%. Um, and again, we need, you know, we just need to be mindful that those numbers are going to fluctuate, mm -hmm. but there is an increase, we think, from about 55% to about 62% in hybrid. Mm -hmm. Thank you. At this time. Okay. Um, I also wanted to address, and we uh, heard earlier, there were some concerns about grading parameters and failing grades and the numbers of students that are failing. Um, and as Dr. Edwards said, uh, this is a reality across the nation, unfortunately. Um, it is not just limited to Lynchburg City School students. We deeply care about our students and we want all of our students to succeed. Um, at the elementary schools, um, I, I'm, I'm covering a little bit of some grading practices, um, Dr. Uh, Brennan, that you asked about. Um, at the elementary schools, um, they are continue to giving the practice of giving a 49% instead of a zero. Mm -hmm. So if a student has missing work, um, they receive a 49%, um, and this is at the elementary school. If a student receives a failing grade, let's say I turn in an assignment, but the grade is a 35% or a 40%, um, a failing grade is a 50. So again, this is at the elementary level. Um, all over, including elementary, secondary, um, middle school, and high school, teachers have extended deadlines. Um, we have opened grading windows to collect missing work. Um, teachers are reporting more missing work uh, versus failing assignments. So we're really trying to work with our students and our families of, uh, that are of this, with the students that are not turning in, that have missing assignments, uh, to reach out to them, to give them support, uh, whether it is a phone call, an email, uh, an online Zoom tutoring session with a teacher, some encouragement, uh, reaching out with a school counselor to give them some encouragement, or it might be a home visit in the yard uh, to see how students are doing. So we really are trying to work with our students who are basically non-participatory and are not turning in, in the work. Um, we're, we are working uh, to implement some learning loss modules. Uh, we are going to use Virtual Virginia uh, for some core content uh, learning, mo learning loss modules. Uh, for our elementary students, and we're working this week to get that in place. Uh, we're also uh, looking and going to use some learning loss modules for reading and math at the middle and high school level through um, a partnership that we currently have with Edgenuity. Um, and we also have some credit recovery opportunities uh, for high school students through Edg Edgenuity. So we're really working with those students who are struggling, who are failing, um, and who are not turning in their in their work and have missing assignments. Um, we're also, um, with Edgenuity, we're expanding 
Um, our partnership with them and so our middle and high school students will be able to access after hours tutoring um, through this service as well so they can get some help um, outside of, of LCS support. So I did want to address that because you had asked that and it has also been brought up and it is a reality and we're aware of it um, and, and we're working to do what we can to support our students and our families. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amy. Dr. Carter. Um, Dr. Um, Mrs. Key, thank you for the information, especially the fact that we really do care and that this is not just happening at LCS. But my question is, so uh, I was thinking maybe it was work that how we could help them make it up, but it may be just a matter of whether or not it's in an outbox or somewhere else that maybe, are we able to go into the devices to see if there are any homework assignments mm -hmm. that were maybe weren't ac um, adequately, adequately uploaded? Because I know like on Seesaw, sometimes you thought you had clicked and then you still see all these numbers. Um, is there anything we can do like that um, to see if those those assignments are out there or in the on those devices and absolutely and I do know that um, and I will give a, a shout out to our IT department um, Chuck Yarborough who's the supervisor of instructional technology as well as the ITRTs they've really been working to support not only the teachers in helping um, but also the the students and the families and I know on numerous occasions students and families um, have come in and brought their device and, and they sit side by side, six feet apart, but the, you know, with the masks on, but they are helping the students and, and the parent understand how to submit an assignment and, how, and, and the process to do that. In some cases, it has been that the, the student thought they had submitted it, but they really hadn't, and so they work with them to make sure. It's in some cases that um, the students said they submitted it, um, <coughs> but they actually hadn't done the assignment. So there is a way for us to check and see if they've even done the assignment in Google Drive, if it's in Google Classroom. So if they're a student in third through 12th grade, we would be able to see if they've actually even completed the assignment. Um, and if, it, if they have, then they certainly would be able to submit it. Um, but I do want people to know that we are extending deadlines. I want the community and our students and, and families to know we have extended deadlines. If your child has missing work and you have concerns, please reach out to your student's teacher. Um, I know that they will work with you and support you. Um, and please then, if, if uh, you don't get a response, please reach out to, to the school principal and they will also support you in that. Uh, uh, Dr. Carter has a follow-up question then, then Mr. Harvey. Is there a grace period to the time, say if I'm, um, a remote learner now and I want to go to the hybrid but then I said no I, I want to stay remote or virtual then is there a grace period can I change it how what time when do I have that's the final thing you can't change if you wanted to return if you had been remote for first semester and you wanted to return to hybrid or come into hybrid for the first time that deadline was in November um, at any point in time, a student who is hybrid may return to remote, but when you make that choice to return to remote, that's for the remainder of the semester. Lose your spot. And I keep hearing that the bus drivers are sometimes confused. They don't get the students or, or the assignments. So what are we doing to try to help the bus drivers so they are able to get the names of the students that need to go to what schools and what time? So that they won't be um, struggling with that or because I hear that a lot yes they they we, we have heard that and I know that um, uh, Mr. Gatsky um, is working with uh, um, the director in transportation with with um, Mr. A in transportation to work on that there have been some challenges in the past because the transportation route routes were based on geographic locations and so it maybe picking up several students in one area and then driving to pick up where in the past we've our routes have basically been in in neighbor, certain neighborhoods um, across the city and so we are working and I think for this second semester those routes have been altered so that problem should be eased quite significantly Mr. Harvey uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best to to try to phrase this question correctly um, 
And I want to focus specifically on the high school scores because those are the ones that have received the most attention publicly. Um, in looking at those results, is there a way to disseminate the difference between a student who is trying to participate, trying to learn, versus students who might be habitually absent from participating? So in other words, we're, 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 we're seeing a number, a percentage increase between last year and this year, and I'm wondering if there are some students that just because they're working remotely um, have the have a little more freedom to avoid school altogether is what, what I'm sort of asking. So when we look at those numbers and that percentage increase of failure, is it that those are students who are trying to actively participate? If it is, then that, that talks to us a little bit about remote learning. But if we have a high volume of students who just who just are not participating at all, it skews those numbers. <laughs> Go ahead. I just address the, the, and then Amy, you can get into the specifics. Um, the data, whenever we receive the FOIA request, it, it's sent out in, the, in the, the way that it is in our system. So the data that was sent out in our system was not in percentages um, at all. It was just sent out as a count the way our, um, student information system has it. And sometimes that's frustrating for community members because they, they want it a certain way and it's not how we have it. I will tell you how we look at data. We absolutely look by kid and participation. So we, we have data that says we, we know who's remote and inactive. We'll say that, right? You know, or, or, or seemingly inactive, we're not seeing it. And then how we approach that child and who's knocking on doors and things like that, that's how we're looking at the data. I think we as a community need to be careful when, um, when data is put out there in a certain way. Um, and, and I'm not saying anything here or there about that, that I don't want our community to think that we aren't looking at our kids individually as kids or individually as families or recognizing which families have just moved from three different places and that might explain the failure right now and and you know i'll be one to say you know we don't let, let that go for right now because the immediate family need is the more important need we'll catch you up in that kind of thing so i need to say that on behalf of all of my staff and and social workers and school counselors who dig into person by person, um, and, and not so much just broad figures um, with that, so. And, and I appreciate that, because I think that's a very good point, because the, the information that was presented tonight using percentages, it sounds rather large, but when you look at the numbers, I mean, they're still, they're still important because each one of those numbers is a student, but, but when you increase from one to two, that's a sizable percentage but it's still a relatively smaller number in the overall student body of, of LCS. But. Yes, and, and Dr. Edwards said exactly what I was going to say. We do have that information by student. That's not something that we can and, and would um, release to the community, um, individual student information, but yes, we have it and we have looked at it. Uh, Dr. Jordan and her team worked with every single school in November and December to do um, data um, meetings to look at the data, to look at the students who we call non-participatory um, and, and, um, and what we could do to reach out to them to look at those numbers. So yes, we have it and yes, we are looking at it and we are addressing it um, as, as best we can. And again, I, I want to say this is, this is not something that is unique to Lynchburg City Schools. Um, this is something, it, it's not something um, that, that we certainly are proud of and we're ignoring and putting our heads in the sand to say, well, yes, we have students are failing, but it's a pandemic and we just walk away from it. But this is happening everywhere. Um, and so this is not unique to Lynchburg City Schools. But we, yes, um, Mr. Harvey, we are looking at it and we do have that information. Further questions from the board regarding uh, what a uh, few is presented? All right, thank each of you for that, and thank you, Ms. Pugh, for your sharing. And we realize that COVID-19 has exacerbated 
of many dynamics, and we are got to get the story out that our people are working hard, student by student, family by family, to deal with the achievement gap and all of that. And this board is closely paying attention to the monitoring of our administration in that regard. Dr. Edwards? Okay, so with regard to return to play, um, you will know that since uh, July, our athletic uh, teams and, and leadership team and athletes and um, coaches and trainers have all been working diligently to provide opportunities for, at first for students to condition and, and train and get ready for season. And now we are here um, with the season. And I, I just want to say kudos to um, all of our coaches and trainers um, and, and ADs and principals who work collaboratively together to try to make something happen for kids because we recognize, we hear from the kids. You see it all across the country where they're saying, let me play, let me do these kinds of things. And we want to try to do that in a safe manner as possible. So I did ask the two ADs to kind of give you a quick blurb on where they are and how um, things are going at um, both Glass and uh, Heritage. So take it away, Elizabeth. Good evening. I'm Elizabeth Masonkopf, EC Glass Athletic Director, and I wanted to provide you with a brief video update on where we currently stand in athletics. January 11, 2021, Winter Sports and Activities Contest begin. This includes boys and girls basketball, wrestling, swim, indoor track, sideline cheer, and scholastic bowl. Teams will complete a 60% version of a normal schedule. The games postponed from the initial start on December 21, 2020 have been folded into the schedule that resumes on January 11, 2021. Games schedules can be found on our school website or directly at seminaldistrictva.org. This season, where feasible, teams will play a Seminole District schedule to limit travel and exposure. Seminole District teams will not allow spectators for this season. EC Glass will stream home basketball and wrestling through NFHS. Links will be found on the school website, game website, and our social media sites as they become available. As it has been for everyone, this season will be fluid. Opposing schools and I will work together to adjust schedules as potential COVID-19 cases arise. This means that often games may be canceled within short notice. When rescheduling is feasible, we will do so. In an effort to maintain the safety of our athletes, coaches, and staff, we will do the following. All coaches and staff will wear masks at all times. Athletes will wear masks when not in game play, i.e. sitting on the sidelines, riding the bus, etc. The team seating will be socially distanced. Everyone entering the building will be screened and documented. Following all CDC, VHSL, and LCS guidelines, proper sanitation will occur for seating, equipment, entrances, etc. Out-of-season teams will continue to condition under VHSL and LCS guidelines in preparation for their upcoming seasons by doing things that include masks being worn by staff and coaches at all times, masks worn by athletes when not taking part in physical activity. Athletes will work in pods within their teams, which are small groups to limit exposure, pre-screening for every conditioning session, and 10 feet of physical distancing when physical activity is taking place. Fall sports and activities will begin in February with spring sports to follow in April. As always, our top goal is to guarantee the safety of our children, coaches, and staff. Since bringing teams back in July, we have been so fortunate to have an excellent group of coaches and staff that have consistently and constantly improvised, adapted, and overcome every hurdle to give our students a chance at extracurriculars this school year. I hope that this helps to give you some insight into athletics. I thank you for your time and Happy New Year. Good evening, I am Dennis Knight, Heritage High School Athletic Director, and I want to provide you with a brief update of where we currently are at, in athletics at Heritage High School. Uh, Elizabeth and I have talked about this uh, video, and she has done a great job explaining some of the other processes involving scheduling of games, uh, teams that we're playing, where we're playing, how we're playing, uh, and it would be no need for, for me to repeat all the information that she's already said. Uh, as she stated earlier, we will begin playing uh, events January 11th. Uh, on that day, we'll have basketball games at both Heritage and EC Glass. Uh, a typical week for winter athletics right now is basically you're looking 
uh, at three to four basketball games per week. Uh, we will play Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and some Saturdays um, because we had to start our season three weeks later. Uh, we are making sure we can get as many games in as we can. The Virginia High School League has provided opportunities for us to play a complete schedule, and we will have to look at that. Uh, we will also have wrestling matches taking place. Um, we will also be doing events like Scholastic Bowl, indoor track, uh, swimming, uh, and all of these events are following the strict guidelines established by the CDC, the BHSL, and Lynchburg City Schools, and the plans that we have in place are to make sure we maintain safety and healthy situations for all people involved in the events. As it has been for everyone this season, uh, this season will be a day-to-day -day operation. Um, you know, at any time, uh, there another school could call and say that we cannot play today, uh, and we understand that we're going to have to, you know, postpone games. The making up of these games because of the time that we have to play will be very limited, uh, and we will try to do the best that we can to make sure that our, our student athletes get all the games in that they can play. In an effort to maintain the safety of our athletes, coaches, and staff will do the following. All opposing teams, media personnel, game day staff will be screened before entering the building. Um, every school will be doing this in the Seminole District, so we feel safe you know, with the mitigation process that we've established as a district, but also maintain the safety and health of our student athletes and coaches as they go to other places. Uh, in our facilities, all people will wear a mask. Uh, except if they're in the game playing. Uh, players sitting on the bench, coaches, um, media personnel, they will all be wearing masks in our building. Uh, the seating of teams, um, they'll be socially distanced. I think one of the things that we've planned when our JV teams were taking two buses to events, uh, that way we kind of limit the interaction from team to team to try to keep from, so we don't have a situation where we have to quarantine the both basketball teams. Uh, when we go on a away game, our JV team will go. When their game is over, they will get back on the bus and come back to Heritage. We will not stay and watch the game. Uh, we just need to do that to make sure we try to stay as healthy as we possibly can. Uh, as Elizabeth said, you know, we do have teams out of season that are working out. They're still following the same guidelines under the phase three guidelines established by the VHSL and Lynchburg City Schools. Uh, and right now, our guys and our student athletes, our coaches are extremely excited to get started. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, playing January 11th. I know you'll be listening to this January 12th, but we'll have a game then too. So uh, if you want to, go ahead and get a uh, package at Na National Federation High School Network, and you can watch Glass and Heritage play all the time. But appreciate everything that you've done to make sure that we've stayed involved athletically. And Happy New Year. Okay, so uh, again, they just wanted to share with you from their voices what uh, we're doing and hopefully you, you could see from there, there's a lot of care, precaution, um, and just concern that our, our two ADs along with the coaching staff, principals, athletes, families, everybody is putting in to just try to provide our kids with the opportunities to to play and engage and, and again, have somewhat of a, a normal <clears throat> high school season if, if that's possible. All right, before we take a five minute break, I do want to make sure any board member who has a thought of sharing during this time, uh, we know that there's been a lot of strong language out there. I hope that we are coming across with strong language that we care about all of our students, our student athletes, a whole uh, lot of preparation. I know all of us may or may not be as abreast of athletic matters, but I think that um, we are all uh, uh, privy to who to contact. So before we break, is there any board member that would like to say anything about our return to play or return to learn? Dr. Gupta. You know, I've heard Dr. Edwards and I trust that you have done due diligence and I support you for what you're doing. 
Thank you for your comments. Uh, Doctor, was anybody, uh, uh, school board member Evans? I, I just want to remind people that you have made it clear that school by school is being looked at. If something happens at a certain school, we are not afraid to come back in and say, we have to shut the school down. Um, I just think that's important for people to realize it doesn't have to be the whole division. We can go by schools, and that's what you will do if we need to do that. Yes. And school board, school by school is at the superintendent admin level. Right. Division wide is at, at our level. And unless otherwise noted tonight, we will remain in phase three and observe very carefully with abundance of caution as we move forward. Hearing no further statement, we're going to take a five-minute recess and we will come right back and uh, go into our new business and move towards the end of our meeting. Thank you very much.
Uh, new business, we have three items uh, to deal with. Uh, the first item is for action, and it is J1, uh, the superintendent uh, contract. And I do want to acknowledge that this item is regarding the superintendent's contract. Uh, before us is an action item to renew Dr. Edwards' contract for a four-year term. It has been discussed by the board and made available to the public. Uh, the uh, action item in relationship to uh, the chair entertaining a motion is uh, that we would approve the contract and in that motion, if there is a board member that will make it, uh, the motion needs to include giving the board chair the authority to sign the contract on behalf of the board if the board does uh, move to uh, renew the contract tonight. Dr. Gupta? I make the motion that the contract be approved and you have the authority to sign it. Second. All right, been moved by Dr. Sin uh, Dr. Uh, Gupta and seconded by Dr. Carter that we renew the superintendent's contract for the stated four-year term and that the school board chair have the authority to sign the contract on behalf of the board. Is there any further question or discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? All right, motion carries. All right, we would, I'm so sorry. Yes, uh, and uh, please let us know, school board member Evans, anything we can do to be helpful. Thank you so much. All right, uh, J2, Capital Improvement Plan, uh, EC Glass Practice Field, Dr. Edwards. Yep, uh, so um, you remember on our Capital Improvement, we talked about the EC Glass Field, and Mr. Gatsky is here to give a short presentation on um, the, the field, the update. Um, um, for this, hold on, let me get my thing right here. Um, for the bids, okay, I had to make sure I'm, I'm talking to you. Ms. Gask. Well, good evening. Um, we're coming this evening to seeking approval to enter into a contract um, for the construction of a new uh, practice field at EC Glass. And this is a multi purpose field that uh, <coughs> will. Uh, because of the use, uh, the high, high anticipated use um, will be uh, artificial turf. Um, this project was included in our CIP at a budget of $1.2 million for uh, construction. And uh, working with city procurement office, we went out for bid and uh, had very good response. Um, on the bid, but um, the uh, lowest bidder was Landtech, um, excuse me, Landtech Group out of uh, Bayshore, New York, um, with a regional office in Ashland, and their bid, their low bid was $978,000, and we are recommending uh, that the, that contractor be awarded this contract. Just to bring you up to what this project is, um, on the board currently is the uh, drawing of what the um, field area looks like right now. Um, just to orient you, at the very bottom, uh, kind of to the left, uh, middle, is the baseball field. To the far right are the tennis courts. Up on the uh, upper right is the uh, football field. And then the, the actual area where this uh, field is going to go in is now it's known as the throwing field, the track and field throwing field, uh, which currently, due to all the rain, is a mud pit. Um, so their EC glass is in. in critical need of athletic space, uh, especially for practices uh, with the many teams that they have. So the uh, intent is to build a field that can basically be used by any sport that wants to use it um, and in any weather that they want to be out there. Um, so we're, 
it's anticipated that this field will get a lot of uh, a lot of use. It is not a game field, and it's not intended to be a game field, but it can be lined and used for whatever whatever they need. And the reason it's not a game field is just not a large enough space to get a full size field for just about any sport. So um, if uh, we can go to the next, uh, before you go, go back, thank you. So where, like I said, that broad semicircular um, spot there across it is, is the steep hill going from the baseball level down to the, to the, where the new field will be. It is currently all wooded. Um, we think that all of, most of all of that is filled dirt from when the school was first built. Mm -hmm. uh, we had borings done. It is on the upper part, on the baseball upper level, it is very wet. Um, and I mean, even wetter down deep than what you would normally expect. So we think it's, it's filled. And we probably, it's also possible that on the lower part there's probably some rubble and whatever in there. And so when you look at the bid sheet, you see three um, uh, unit price uh, items. And those are for either rock ex excavation or for removal of unsuitable sorts, uh, soils. And then have to, we'd have to bring uh, suitable dirt back in if that happens. So um, now we can go to the next. Okay, so now this is the same area, same orientation, but with the new field in uh, shown, drawn in there. So on the bottom of the field, bottom and right side of the field would be a steep bank going down from the baseball level, tennis court level. Um, the, uh, it falls off going to the top, that's the back side. It falls off, it slopes off from there. Upper right, it would be the new throwing area for shot put. Um, this will have uh, an extensive under, underfield drainage system just because we have to have it uh, to meet code. Uh, but that's it. I, I think it's going to be a nice facility for EC Glass. So we are asking for approval to enter into a contract with Lane Tech Group out of New York. All right. Thank you, Mr. Gasket. There is a recommendation <clears throat> for a motion to approve this um, bid submitted by Lane Tech Group Inc. Cork, uh, Inc. Uh, what is the pledge of the board, uh, School Board Member Morrison? I just have a couple of questions. Please. Uh, Mr. Gasket, when this was first proposed, uh, we they desperately need additional practice field at Easy Glass. It's been a concern for a number of years. And so I'm very much in support of this happening for our athletes and our coaches. But when we looked at this several years ago, when it was first brought to the um, board, I specifically asked the question about the shot put and the discus. And at that point, we were told that they would not be displaced, that they would have a place. And I see that you have an area there for shot put, but in terms of the discus throwers, where, where are we seeing them move? It's not what we were originally were told, but I know the need for it to shift. Right. So this is the, the artificial turf field will have discus. Okay. There is a, a, a discus circle on the two, I think it's two back corners <clears throat> on the upper part of the diagram okay. uh, that you're looking at. Um, the reason that the shot put is not there is that the Turf manufacturers, all of them, all the manufacturers that we um, uh, chose to allow to, because we do, uh, we did kind of limit who could um, or what turf we would accept. Let's put it that way. Um, all of those said that you, not to throw shot put on the, right. on the artificial turf due to the fact that it would damage it. Mm -hmm. The uh, a discus, even though it's, uh, you would think that that would damage, cut, cut the surface and whatever, they said no, uh, that that's a kind of a glancing blow and you're mm -hmm. also looking at um, 
you know, hits at one spot one time and, and that's it. Uh, whereas a shot put, it's repeated blows to the same spot. So but they do have their specs. But the discus will be on the artificial turf. Shot put will be up on the, cool. on, at the basically at the uh, end of the football field. Okay. In the grass, in the natural grass. Um, but they'll have the cement um, throw area and all of that. Thank you. Dr. Gupta? You know, I know we are going with the lowest bid in this case. Mm -hmm. And this is my, I always buy local. Even if I buy my car in Lynchburg, I may pay $1,000 more, but I'm providing local employment. So I don't know, hope city will look at, you know, when they encourage us as citizens to buy local, in their contracts, they'll be going in that few thousand dollars here and there, but then you create local employment. So that's my personal opinion. Right. And we do try to do the, the same thing. I mean, we prefer to go with local contractors also uh, when possible. This company here does a lot of sports complexes uh, uh, across the state and across the, the East Coast, um, at least. They've been doing quite a few. The, um, the, the next lowest bidder, GTR, we, the city actually had to disqualify them. Um, and then uh, RSG Landscaping uh, was the third price, but if you'll see, that would, uh, that's a considerably uh, higher price. So, and then, uh, and then Coleman Adams up above. And both of those probably, I mean, we didn't, uh, I can't speak for them, but they would have probably hired another company to come in to actually put the turf down and whatever, whereas this land tech group apparently puts their own, they buy the turf from a manufacturer, but they install it. All right, what is the pleasure of the board? We've been discussing this, as uh, Susan Morrison stated, for some time, and we talk about building and ground equity. I'm so thankful that Glass will, will have these improvements. Uh, what is the pleasure of the board, Dr. Carter? I move that we approve the, the bid submitted by the Land Tech Group Incorporated. Moved by Dr. Carter, there's second by Ms. Morrison. Uh, uh, thank you, Ms. Tarvey. Uh, uh, motion by Dr. Carter, seconded by Ms. Morrison. Any other questions or discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 And uh, those opposed, uh, the motion carries. And thank you, Mr. Gasket, for your fine work and, and thank proceed. You. Uh, the last item under new business will not uh, require much attention at all. Uh, if you have, um, through board docs, uh, the VSBA code of conduct for school board members, uh, just take the opportunity, if you will, just to review that. I think as we are asking our public to have confidence in us, uh, these are some things to just remind yourself in which we are doing and will continue to do uh, as we become uh, and function as we are as a high performing board to meet the needs of kids. So thank you very much. Any uh, statement on that, just uh, there for us to be able to see it and give opportunity uh, for it. I'm, I'm not gonna press the issue about signing or any of that. We just wanted to put that out for our consideration. Any thoughts, questions? All right, thank you so kindly. We will now move to um, the next item on our agenda, which is our um, superintendent comments. Okay. Okay. So first, let me just say thank you for having confidence in me to lead the next four years, um, Lynchburg City Schools. I absolutely love it here, love the kids, um, and wouldn't want to be any place else even in the middle of a pandemic um, right now. And I appreciate your support and your confidence um, in me, and I will say also in my administrative team um, who support me, and without them, it's a hard job. So this by no means is a me thing as it is a we thing, and I include all of us in that we, so thank you for that. Um, and I did just want to point out, looking at the hour, that before our next board meeting in February, um, I want to publicly acknowledge that in two weeks, on January 24th through the 30th, that it will be, um, as uh, by the Commonwealth of Virginia and Governor Northam, uh, Virginia School Principals Appreciation Week. Um, so I did want to acknowledge that 
that that will be coming up on January 24th um, and encourage you all as well as our families uh, to support and love on our principals, especially during a pandemic, um, which is very difficult to lead. And I just want to say to them that I am so pleased to work with such talented individuals um, who give their all for kids. So um, we will not reconvene for another uh, public meeting, our work session, until after this. So I want to make sure everybody was aware of this. Um, Coming, upcoming celebration for principals. And Ms. Morrison, as a former principal, we're going to celebrate you too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> okay, that's it. That's it? All right. Uh, we well, said a lot today. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Edwards, and uh, uh, thank you for uh, receiving the confidence we have in you as our superintendent. Now we move to item L, board comments, and we'll start with Ms. Morrison. Uh, thank you. Nothing. Dr. Carter? Uh, Dr. Brennan? Uh, just two quick things. One is that, um, as Ms. Evans said, we did have the Education Foundation meeting, and that was really very worthwhile, and we'll look forward to doing it again. We really appreciate Jody Gillette and uh, Mac Frankford and, and um, Julie Doyle, who are former board members who participated in that. And as an individual board member, I just wanted to, to thank Dr. Edwards for her work to, for us. We kind of scooted by your contract very quickly because it's at the lower end of the, of, the, of the agenda, but one of the emails that we got uh, read tonight said, you know, if we, if we knew about the COVID pandemic, we would have been board members. I think if you knew about the COVID <laughs> pandemic, you probably wouldn't want to have been superintendent either. But you have done such a great job for us, and we really appreciate it. We're so glad you're going to be here for another four years, and your team that you put together is going to be here with you. Thank you, Dr. Brennan. Dr. Nellis? No, uh, I have no comments. Thank you, sir. Dr. Gupta? I wanted to thank Dr. Edwards for all you have done and you'll be doing for the future of the school district. The other thing I wanted to mention is the governor's school, which I've been saying that for a while. Yes, sir. Uh, the state requires governor's school to share the demographic, uh, demographic, demographic data with them, which the gov school should represent the base schools. And in my opinion, right now they do not, especially the Heritage High School. So having said that, uh, you'll hear that me as a broken record going forward, that we need diversity in governor school and we need diversity in the governor school board because the board is where the diversity, you know, the discussion start. So if the discussion is not happening because I went through their meetings, minutes of the meeting and I don't see anything up there. So that's concerning to me personally. And uh, second thing I want to bring up and I know in the budget and I, I, I heard it was discussed in the finance committee meeting the reinstatement of steps. Any budget we propose to this board, uh, I would like, personally, I would like to see a reinstatement of steps for teachers. Thank you, um, Dr. Gupta. And on your first comment, we will, Mr. Harvey's our rep on the board. And so he, he, he will facilitate that for us and we will have a conversation. And second one, thank you so much. Mr. Harvey. Um, no comment. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank all of you. I, I just want to say to the public, thank you for all of your comments. There's no need to repeat what Dr. Edwards said because she said it so beautifully. We want to hear every comment and each board member will govern themselves accordingly. So thank you uh, for your comments and please continue to engage this board. Uh, my comments are in writing and so you can just look at that. And I do want to acknowledge that the evaluation form that you have is just something for you to look at at this time. Uh, and with FOIA and other dynamics, we will just want to make sure that every board member feels comfortable with the fact that they have some means by which they can clearly communicate with the chair and each other so that we can be as efficient and as effective as we can going forward. And this board chair delights in hearing every comment and thought that you have to share. Thank you all so much. And now uh, for informational items M, the uh, school board work session is scheduled for Tuesday, January the 19th, 2001 at five o'clock. Uh, and uh, the designated uh, place is there. Uh, our next school board meeting will be held Tuesday, February the 2nd. Uh, and the Legislative Advocacy and Community Relations Committee, uh, February the 9th, if that is still standing. 
and the Finance Committee on February the 23rd. Those are the informational items that we have at this time. Some of you may or may not register for the Capital Conference or any other opportunities may come before you. At this time, we will now go to item, uh, agenda item N for closed meeting and pursuant to the Code of Virginia section 2.2-3711A19 for the discussion of reports or plans related to the security of any governmental facility, building or structure, or the safety of persons using such facility, building or structure, specifically discussion of plans related to building security and public safety of Lynchburg City School Board meetings. We will now uh, entertain a motion to move into closed meeting for the purpose so stated. Is there a motion? Make a motion we go into closed session. for the Dr. Brennan makes the motion. Is there a second? Second by Dr. Carter. Any further discussion or questions? Hearing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion carries. We're going to ask now that we would go into a five minute recess because we will need, because of the nature of our closed meeting, we will have to have the building cleared uh, in order to move into our discussion. So in order to allow us to do all of those things, we will reconvene in five minutes.